Absolutely, I'm loading up the live stream now. All right, Mr. Warden, you're good to proceed. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. It's September the 9th, and I want to welcome everyone uh, to our council meeting. Uh, we enjoyed a little bit of uh, liquid sunshine this morning, and with any luck, we'll enjoy some sunshine, sunshine <laughs> <laughs> later today. Okay, so I want to call the meeting to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, Council. We have all members of Gray County Council in attendance for this meeting. Thank you very much. Item number three is our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Anishinaabek, the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, Wyandot, Wyandot peoples on whose traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and Inuit whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. May we all as treaty people live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse peoples. Okay, item number four, is there any declaration of interest, pecuniary or otherwise? Seeing none, we will proceed, but I would ask that if one does uh, come up during the course of the meeting that you declare it at that time. <clears throat> Item number five, adoption of minutes. 5A is adoption of the County Council and Committee of the Whole Minutes dated August the 12th. It is moved by Councillor O'Leary and seconded by Councillor Woodbury. Any, any debate? If not, then I will call the question is there anyone opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. Next is the Committee of the Whole closed uh, meeting minutes dated August the 12th. That is moved by Councillor Woodbury and seconded by Councillor Boddy. Uh, if there's any debate on that, we would need to go back into closed session. So perhaps I will call the question, is there anyone opposed? And seeing none, that too is carried. 5C is the Long-Term Care Redevelopment Planning Task Force Minutes dated August 5th, 2021. It is moved by Councillor Burley and seconded by Councillor Robinson. Any discussion on that item? And see, oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Deputy Warden McQueen. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. There's a point in there I was just wanting to raise that was discussed. And uh, it was the part around the discussion around Gray Gables uh, with regards to the building, with regards to the report that says here, staff noted that based on phase one results from the SHS Salter pylon, it was recommended to take a broad view on what the community needs uh, on community, uh, sorry, what community needs on ba uh, based on community input. It also says that Mr. Switcher noted that phase, uh, phase two of the report from SHS Salter Pylon on Gray Gables will be received shortly and the results will be shared at a future committee meeting. I guess my question here is, is do we know when that report will be coming forward? I don't know who I'm turning to. Randy. Yeah, Randy? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that that question. Um, we anticipated uh, receiving that draft uh, by the end of August. Uh, we haven't received that yet from SHS, so we we hope to receive that uh, in the very near future. Um, once once reviewed, we'll then obviously bring that forward to the redevelopment uh, long term care redevelopment committee uh, for for review and comments. So we're hoping that will be probably later in uh, later in September that report. 
Okay, thank you for that uh, information and thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, then I will call the question. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that too is carried. Item 5B is the Committee of the Whole close, oh, excuse me, 5B. Committee of the Whole close uh, meeting minutes dated August the 12th. Um, no. no, 5D. 5D, yeah, I'm reading B, my apologies. A special Committee of the Whole minutes uh, dated August 26, 2021. Uh, that is moved by Councillor Klumpus and seconded by Councillor Milne. Uh, Councillor Soever. Yes. Um I'm kind of disappointed in these minutes in that um, the whole reason for the, the special meeting was to have the number of $400,000 per bed confirmed. And there's no mention of the $400,000 number here. I mean, there's some, you know, there's a lot of verbiage about, um, you know, the various uh, things that were discussed um, in very vague terms. But, you know, I think you know, the $400,000 number was the number that was uh, asked about at the previous meeting. The consultant was brought in and did acknowledge that that was what they were there for, was to, to provide us with that information on which we were making a very serious decision. And, um, you know, I just find it, um, you know, a little strange that the minutes don't say that that was what was discussed was, you know, and, and confirmed to us because um, I reviewed the video of the meeting and certainly um, there, it was confirmed to us that the 400,000 was a number that we could rely upon in making our decision. And that even though the land was, uh, you know, we don't have any land costs or development charges and the site is fully serviced, that the consultant did confirm that they were aware that of other projects in similar circumstances that came in at that number. And, and those are very significant uh, matters that we were confirmed to us because um, you know we, we did rely on that number or, or some of us did um, in making a decision to defer this project. And um, you know I think it's important that that be reflected in the minutes. So, I would like to move an amendment that the uh, minutes uh, reflect that that $400,000 number was confirmed to us in making our de um, decision. Okay, Madam Clerk, I'm in your hands. You will need a second or first, uh, sir. Um, okay. Do we have a seconder for that? I'll second it. I have Deputy Warden McQueen, thank you. Okay, discussion. So now I will just um, note that um, the minutes of council uh, meetings are to be without note or comment and uh, a committee of the whole. So that's how the minutes were drafted. There is a, a information in there, generally speaking about the discussion, um, but they are to be without note or comment. Um, I'm leaving it up to, to council to determine um, how to proceed, but that's generally, how we proceed with the minutes. Is that to be without note or comment, including what's proposed by the motion? The motion is there, it stands on its own. Um, we generally, if there is um, a larger discussion, such as there was at this one, we generally capture um, a very broad overview of the information. I'm not sure that I'm, um... Um, understanding your recommendation with respect to the motion that's before us. Sorry, I, I'm not recommending anything, Mr. Warden. I'm just uh, providing some information that that normally our minutes are without note or comment. Um, there is just a general, um, with items such as this, there's a general um, piece of information put in there. Okay, so I think we'll take uh, your comments uh, in into consideration in, in the vote that's to come. I see several speakers, so we'll start with uh, Deputy Warden McQueen on the motion that's before us. Sorry, I, I guess I was leaving it up to uh, be a seconder for that. Sorry about that. I will maybe speak later on, but I don't have any comments at this point. Okay, uh, Councillor Milton, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And certainly uh, the clerk's explanation of uh, without note or comment has always been my understanding. 
any uh, verbiage that is added is at the discretion of the of the note taker. Uh, but the motion and the vote results are there for everyone to see and any background, any further background information is in generally in the agenda uh, information. So I'm quite satisfied with the way the way the minutes are and they reflect the motions and the results of the motions uh, accurately, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sowever, you're next. Yes, and I fully understand the, the position that the, it's without note and comment, but in this case, it is very germane because the whole purpose of the meeting was to confirm the $400,000 number. And um, the, the consultant did acknowledge that was what he was there to do. Um, and, and so th that is not a comment or, or note. Um, in the minutes right now, it says, Mr. Rodriguez spoke about the scope of the project and associated costs. But, you know, okay, so that's fine. But what did he tell us about the costs? I mean, that's what we were all attending a special meeting to hear from him. Um, what it was he going to tell us about the costs? Were they solid that we could rely upon them to make our decision? So I think that's very germane. That's not a note or comment. That is the sub... That is the whole point of the discussion. And so that's very substantive. And um, to exclude that number so that there is no written record as that is what the basis of our decision was, um, you know, I don't think that's note or comment. That's uh, fundamental to the whole discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam CAO. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I would only note for, for Council's reference, to, similar to the comment that Councillor Milne provided, that um, the presentation made by Colliers is included in the agenda package, and that presentation um, clearly states the numbers that um, Andrew was uh, advising us on, and his remarks are referred to in the minutes. So. I think we have to look at the information provided to council in its entirety. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, then I will call the question on the motion. And, and Madam uh, Clerk, just to be clear, uh, the motion is? That the minutes of the committee a whole meeting dated August 26, 2021 be amended to reflect that the estimated cost of $400,000 per bed was confirmed to allow council to make an informed decision. Excellent. So you're either voting in favor of that uh, motion or not. Um, Mr. Warden, I'd like a recorded vote. Uh, I think we have a speaker just before that, but I, I will do that. Um, Deputy Warden McQueen. Just a point, thank you, Mr. Ward. I'm going back to the minutes of August 12th, Committee of the Whole, and it does speak in there um, that staff be requested to have Colliers provide an overview of the performance costs for long-term care facilities and request evaluation for the existing 66 bed unit for a gable. So I, I think there is there was direction through those minutes that we wanted to know about cost and you know, I, I understand the Madam Clerk with regards without note and comment, but I think as, as speaking along with what um, Mr. Swever is talking about, this special meeting was specifically to talk about that cost. And if you look at those minutes of, of August 12th, Committee of the Whole, it does sort of, it's ramping up to having that further discussion, which the uh, warden called the special meeting and we did talk about costs. So I just, I think there was some direction in those minutes uh, and, and pouring up talking about it. So it's more specific of that meeting of the cost. So I certainly support uh, Mr. Swever in the sense of noting the part of, of the 400,000. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Okay. Thank you. I think, oh, Councilor Desai. Thank you, Warden. Next, um, <clears throat> the, the only question I have is, would we be setting a sort of a precedence if we, if we vote in favor of this? Because um, I went back to, um, to the presentation made by uh, made by colleagues, Mr. Rodriguez, it's on the second. It's the first line on the second slide that the cost is three hundred seventy thousand dollars to four hundred plus thousand dollars. So, um, I, I I find that I agree with Councillor Milne that 
for further information, there is the agenda package, which on the um, county website, you have the uh, agenda package um, followed by the minutes. So you have the agenda package for it. So um, I worry uh, about the kind of precedence we might be setting. Okay, I'm wanting to call the uh, question. So I guess, Councillor Soever, you'll be the last speaker. Yes, and um, I, I would just say that the minutes are the official record of the meeting and, and the other materials are ancillary to that. And, um, you know, although the video and on all the other materials, but the official record of the meeting is still the minutes. Thank you. So I think we're now ready to call the question on the a motion to amend the special meeting um, committee of the whole minutes dated August 26, 2021. All those, oh, well, I'll turn it over to Madam Clerk since it's a recorded uh, vote. Thank you, Mr. Wharton. Um, so if you're voting in favor, if you're voting for the amendment, you're voting opposed, if you are not in favor of the amendment. Councillor Mackey. In favor. Councillor Gamble. In favor. Councillor Burley. Opposed. Councillor Carlton. Opposed. Councillor McQueen. In favor. Councillor Desai. Opposed. Councillor Patterson. Opposed. Gordon Hicks. Opposed. Councillor Klumpus. Opposed. Councillor Keaveny. Opposed. Councillor Boddy. Opposed. Councillor O'Leary. Opposed. Councillor Woodbury. Opposed. Councillor Millen. Opposed. Councillor Soever. In favor. Councillor Potter. In favor. Councillor Robinson. In favor. And Councillor Hutchinson. In favor. Oh, I'm sorry, I've lost my formula on my... Um, <laughs> My spreadsheet here, my apologies. I'm going to go out in a limb and guess 50 to 40. No, it's not. It's not. The motion is lost 34 to 56. Thank you very much. We'll turn next to item number uh, seven, uh, which is- Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Warden. We actually haven't adopted the minutes oh, of the I, special I, oh, meeting. Yes, that's right. Um, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Warden, if I might, um, I think it was only uh, Councillor Keaveny that switched her vote. So does she have six votes? Uh, Councillor Keaveny has five, so my- my apologies if my quick math is not correct. That would be 5535, I believe. <sighs> oh, you are correct, sir. I'm sorry, 35 to 55. My apologies. Okay. So we are now going to turn back to 5D, um, approval of the uh, minutes of the Committee of the Whole, dated August 26th. Uh, call the question. And anyone opposed to that? Oh, are you indicating opposed or uh, Deputy Warden McQueen? Yeah, so if I can speak to the motion before we, we vote on it, please, so that's okay. I thought we had talked, uh, spoke to the motion, but perhaps not. Okay, um, go right ahead. Yeah, we, we I think just as clarity, uh, councillors, whoever brought an amendment 
to the motion, but now we're on the, that loss. So now we're just speaking to the, the minutes itself. So, okay. uh, and, and, and they need uh, support to ratify the decision of the meeting. Um, so I guess the point that I like to raise, um, Mr. Warden, County Council is, is the point I raised in the minutes of uh, the Committee of the Whole, August 5th, of getting the report back on uh, from SHS with regards to phase two of Gray Gables. I would say probably there will be information that will come back that sort of completes that overall picture of, of the economics and of, of the current Gray Gables and how that looks. I know we did have that already for Rockwood and um, I was just wondering if there was consideration of, um, of def deferring these minutes uh, until that report is to come because I think it's really uh, prudent information to have before this final decision is made. And um, I'll leave it up there for discussion at this point, Mr. Ward. Okay, well, that's a suggestion. It's not a motion. So I'll, I'll just move on to Councillor Soever. Yes, um, I, I was gonna say the same thing, but um, the, yeah, cause uh, it'll be interesting to see, I gathered, I'm not sure exactly what's gonna be included in this SHS report, but from what I understand, it's uh, to look at the, the whole project as a campus of care, which would then probably, uh, you know, expand, expand upon what we were requesting anyway, which was what is the existing building worth in, in the scope of that larger project? And does it does it add any revenue, which might reduce the tax hit? Obviously, if the campus of care project is a positive net positive um, in terms of um, the overall economics of the project, I mean that's what has been demonstrated by private industry and also by our neighbors in Simcoe, who have a very successful campus of care in Penetanguishene. Um, you know so. Uh, hopefully there will be some uh, economics in that report that will further shed light on the overall economics of the Gray Gables expansion. And uh, I look forward to seeing that report. Thank you, Madam CAO. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, the members of the uh, redevelopment task force would recall the earlier discussion that we had with um, SHS and Salter Pilon regarding uh, the, the final report for uh, Gray Gables, which was focused on um, looking at the, that facility as its potential with to either provide um, rehabilitation space associated with um, the new hospital or um, assisted living. Um, either way, the, and depending on what the report, um, which direction they come back with or they come back with uh, numbers on both, um, I think it's just important for council to, to, to note that um, there will be some extensive renovation required likely to the existing Gray Gables facility, which would also need to be factored into any calculations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see no further hands, so perhaps it's time to call the oh, Councillor uh, Deputy Warden McQueen. You're, you're, you're pretty. You're pretty quick, Mr. Warden. I, I put my hand down, so it didn't look like I was leaving it up there too long. But uh, um, just to follow up with that uh, to you and County Council, I think that's the, the the important part is is getting that information. Also, the public input on that. That's it's part of what it reads is is to get that broader base public input. And so, um, Mr. Warden, I'd like to move a, a motion to defer the approval of these minutes until that uh, report is uh, presented to the uh, committee, which then will have a broader base for County Council to see that report. I think it's prudent that uh, we get the whole picture. County Council gets the whole picture because it's sort of like possibly uh, buying a new vehicle and you don't know what you're gonna get for a trade-in. Well, a lot of times uh, as we upgrade our vehicles, we wanna know what the trade-in value is because that helps uh, determine your well, your decision on, on purchasing that vehicle. So I, I just use that as a small analogy, but I just think that it's important that we get that information before we make this final decision. So I'd like to move that motion, Mr. Warden. 
Thank and we you, defer John. until the SHS report comes back. Okay, I'm looking for a seconder. Um, Councilor Desai, are you second? Oh, okay. Uh, do I have a second? Oh, I see Councilor Potter, thank you. All right, so it's probably before us. Any uh, discussion or debate on this motion to defer? Um, Councilor Desai. Sure, we're next. The one question that I do have is that if this goes ahead today, then the direction to put a pause on, uh, on, on the Gray Gables project uh, is ratified. My question is, uh, depending on, on what the SHS uh, report says, um, would we be able to come back and say, well, you know, this report is, uh, provides evidence that it's feasible to move forward on the Gray Gables project, um, so therefore we should direct staff to uh, go forward. Would that, would that uh, be a motion that could come at that point? Madam Clerk? I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Desai, I didn't sorry, quite. I, I think I can take it, Heather, and okay. I think the answer would be yes. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Okay, uh, Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Warden. Good morning, County Council. Uh, I think my question was uh, similar to uh, Councillor Desai's. I'm just wondering what information triggers, uh, you know, the decision of County Council has been to uh, put Greg Gables on hold. Of hold. Just wondering what decisions or what information uh, would trigger that to come back to County Council, um, you know, yeah. specifically. Thank you. I would assume um, it would either be a recommendation coming from the redevelopment uh, uh, committee or a motion, uh, notice of motion brought by a councillor. But if anyone else wants to add to that answer. Feel free. Okay, Councillor Soever. Yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering, would that then not be considered a reconsideration? Yes. Yes, it would be. Okay, am I ready to call the question on the motion to defer? And is there anyone opposed? Mr. Warden, I'd like a recorded vote. All right, turn it over to you, Madam Clerk. Okay, on the motion to defer the August 26th meetings, minutes, sorry. Councillor Mackey. In favor of deferring? Councillor Gamble. In favor of defer. Councillor Burley. Opposed. Councillor Carlton. Opposed. Councillor McQueen. In favor. Councillor Desai. Opposed. Councillor Patterson. Opposed. Warden Hicks. Nay. Councillor Klumpus. Opposed. Councillor Keaveny. In favor. Councillor Body. Opposed. Councillor O'Leary. Opposed. I'm sorry, sir. Opposed. Thank you. Councillor Woodbury. Opposed. Councillor Millen. Opposed. Councillor Soever. In favor. Councillor Potter. In favor. Councillor Robinson. In favor. Councillor Hutchinson. In favor. That motion is lost 40 to 50. Okay, we are back on the main. Um, Mr. Mr. Warden, can I have a point of clarity, please? Sure, go ahead. So the point of clarity I was just seeking is if it comes back for um, a reconsideration, what's the procedure in doing that uh, to come back for a reconsideration? Um, if I may, Mr. Warden, um, I just find my reconsideration page. Um, uh, motion to, so it's section 2112 of the procedural bylaw. 
Motion to can reconsider a resolution entered upon the minutes will only be received or put within one year of the decision of council. If the notice of intention to introduce such a motion to reconsider is given in writing at the previous meeting of council, the request, request excuse me, includes reasons for the request for reconsideration. The request for reconsideration is agreed upon by majority support and only a member who voted on the prevailing side of the original motion may request reconsideration of a vote. Thank you for that clarity. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to call the question on the main uh, motion, which is approval of the um, minutes dated August uh, 26th. Is there anyone opposed? And seeing none, I'm gonna say that that is carried. Okay, item six, I do not believe we have any closed uh, meeting matters. Um, Item seven is the uh, Board of Health uh, minutes dated July 23rd and the Board of Health Executive um, meeting minutes, which was dated August 23rd, 2021. That is moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor O'Leary. Um, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Warden Hicks and good morning, County Council. I have one item to share. Two Ontario Seniors Dental Projects that were approved in the Health Units 2020 budget are underway. Due to the size and scope of the projects, approval to carry forward the uh, funding uh, to 2021 was granted. So contracts have been awarded and renovations are underway for a clinic in Owen Sound and Markdale. This program is aimed to help low-income seniors access dental care. Eligible seniors must be 65 years or older and enrolled in the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program. We have a bit of uh, feedback from someone. Going to the car wash. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know who the culprit was. <laughs> so to qualify, um, income for a single senior is 22200 or less. And for a couple, the combined income is 37,100 or less. And seniors must be enrolled in the program. So if you know of anyone that may need dental care, please have them call the health unit to be enrolled. And once these clinics are up and running, there will be communications issued. So that's uh, good, good news for our seniors and dental care. Thanks, Warden Hicks and County Council. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, Dr. Ara is with us, and so I'll turn the floor to him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my, my update has uh, two components. The uh, first one is on COVID, the other one is related to corporate, and I will start with the second one just because it's brief. Uh, we received an uh, announcement from the Ministry about uh, the 2022 um, uh, funding uh, for mitigation funding uh, for the formula of public health funding by the county. and. Um, Ministry and and the confirmation is uh, that in the 2022 20, uh, the funding is going to be in place. So that is uh, good news. And the first item is related to uh, the COVID situation. Uh, we've seen the numbers increasing provincially over the past few weeks. Locally, we have maintained an average of less than five, with few uh, days with zero new cases, which is quite manageable. The uh, vaccine level um, in uh, coverage in the population in Gribrus is uh, a bit over 82% first dose, 77 um, second two doses. And uh, that is a slow progress comparing to the target of 90%. Um, however, it, is, uh, it seems to be cross the board in the province. And the recent work uh, on policy and advocacy and the uh, announcement of vaccine passports seems to uh, start having effect over the past uh, uh, week, we've seen increase in, in the number of uh, people attending our clinics. Um, on, on the front of um, access to, to the vaccine, we continue to have pop-up clinics across Grey Bruce in September, and we have pop-up clinics or school-based clinics in every school in Grey Bruce that is planned in September as well. And, and that will be for the first dose and second dose as well that might extend in October. Uh, the work uh, on uh, promotion of the vaccine advocacy and policy is uh, across multiple sectors to support in 
developing policies requiring vaccine according to the provincial direction. And uh, with these policies comes the requirement of uh, testing for people who don't, uh, who choose not to receive the vaccine and antigen testing targeted for this narrow group, the people who have not, or the employees who have not got the vaccine is another task. And we're working with uh, the uh, different partners, including the Chamber of Commerce and, and the um, uh, municipalities to, to ensure uh, the information is available and the testing is available. Um, vaccine certificates, uh, providing the public information, how to get uh, the certificates and work with different partners also is another task. Um, and and uh, in general, uh, Mr. Chair and Council, uh, I see uh, the preparedness for the fourth wave uh, on multiple scenarios and, and there is uncertainty which scenario is going to uh, develop. Uh, there is always that scenario of a new variant of concern, and and that is that is a slight chance, especially that we know that the variants so far uh, have had uh, the same response to vaccine, which is reassuring. There is uncertainty about the waning immunity. Um, the evidence from the states shows it's around eight months, and if that's the case, and that's the direction in Ontario, we will we are preparing. Um, um, to, to have a third dose uh, across the board for, for the eligible population. And that preparedness will, will take place over the coming few weeks as well. Um, and uh, the, the um, final layer of uncertainty is the fatigue from the public and uh, uh, how much um, the public can comply and, and um, accept restrictions, whether it's the mask or uh, moving to stages if, if we need to. And um, the fatigue in the staff, the healthcare system, and public health, um, all these things add another layer of uncertainty. Nevertheless, we're preparing, we're hoping for the best, but preparing for, for all these scenarios. I'll stop there, Mr. Chair. Open to questions as always. Thank you very much, Dr. Aaron. There is a question from Councillor Milne. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, good morning, uh, Dr. Era. Uh, my question. Rec uh, resolves or revolves around the issue of fully vaccinated people um, contracting the virus. And, you know, I've had a number of people quiz me about what, what is the outcome from these people that are getting uh, the virus that are fully vaccinated? Is it very mild? Is, is, is it similar to people that are unvaccinated? And why are the people getting the virus if they're fully vaccinated because uh, we've been told for quite a while that you're you're safe in in brackets so i wonder if you might comment on that please through you mr chair it's a core question and and the evidence is overwhelming that uh, the outcome if a person is infected is milder than without uh, a vaccine and and uh, the evidence is very clear that uh, uh, there is a protection with the vaccine uh, and there is no vaccine that is 100%. We know this uh, from, from science, from different vaccines. And in this case, the clinical trials uh, showed that 95% uh, will, of people will, will be protected from severe disease. And uh, there is a significant reduction in transmission. With the Delta variant, this number goes down to around 88. Nevertheless, that's an excellent number. And it's worth noting that um, with the numbers we have right now, the, the majority of, of people who are infected are people without vaccine, who have not received the vaccine. If we go to hospitalization, the data is clear from the states, from Canada, 99.5 uh, of people who enter the hospital for COVID are people who um, have not received the vaccine. Uh, so that is very, very reassuring uh, statistic. And... Uh, uh, it, it is worth noting another layer to, to this question, although it's not part of the question, but it's important there. The higher we go up in the coverage in the public of the vaccine, the more yield of people who had the vaccine who will be infected. And you can go to the extreme example of if you have 100% of the public vaccinated, we're going to find a number of people, 5%, who are vaccinated, who receive the vaccine, who, who get the disease. And we're going to find 0% people who are not vaccinated who get the disease because everybody's already vaccinated. Uh, of course, this is a theoretical uh, example, but it shows that the fact that there are people getting the infection after the vaccine does not really 
speak to the fact that the vaccine is not effective. It's actually effective for 95% of the public. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Councillor Mackey, you're next. Thank you, Warden. Thank you, Dr. Air, for being with us today. My question last night on uh, CBC News, uh, there was a couple of doctors speaking about medical exemptions and basically saying that, uh, you know, the one was a family GP who is uh, receiving lots of requests for medical exemptions. Uh, he has not given any yet. And uh, the other doctor uh, that was on really couldn't uh, give any uh, uh or couldn't in his mind see where there would be any medical exemptions with the exception, I think, of someone that had a, a severe reaction to the first dose, that, uh, that might cause the, uh, a medical exemption. Can you just speak to uh, uh, your opinions on medical exemptions, please? Through you, Mr. Chair, what you said is, is precisely correct. Uh, the list of exemptions from NASI is very narrow. It's related to severe reaction to the first dose or uh, severe reaction, allergic reaction to uh, uh, to a component of the vaccine that's known before. Uh, and in both cases, there are clinics that uh, can provide the dose in incremental, uh, provide the vaccine in incremental doses to, to get rid of the allergy and provide the immunity. And um, the recommendation from OMA, Ontario Medical Association, is to, uh, to all physicians to be very, very prudent in following that list. Um, it, it is uh, worth noting on this question that in a discussion with the uh, Vaccine Task Force for Grebers yesterday, we identified that a um, number of people who might have provided or mentioned to their employer that they have medical exemption um, might, might not really uh, fall into that uh, category that's eligible for, for um, uh, exemption. And uh, a third party assessment of, of the exemption is available for the employer. And, and uh, we are uh, sending a communication from the health unit to the employees and the public about uh, the subject as well, just to provide more information. Thank you. Anything further, Councilor Mackey? No, that, that's great. I appreciate that. I, I think it's important that we do communicate uh, uh, it appears like people may be trying to access uh, medical exemption as a way of uh, avoiding vaccination. So it was uh, good to hear that there's really uh, very limited reasons for that. Uh, just a follow-up question, uh, Dr. Era, and it's in regards to the uh, so the uh, uh, anti uh, or the uh, antigen testing. Uh, as far as frequency, what would your recommendation be for employers as far as the frequency of that uh, antigen testing for? Uh, employees that may not uh, want to be vaccinated. Through you, Mr. Chair, at this point with the epidemiology at hand, I would recommend uh, twice per week. Very good. Thank you. Next is uh, Councillor Gamble. Yes, thank you, Warden. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Era. Uh, just to change the direction here, I read with interest this morning of a new virus out of India that seems to be very alarming. I, I can't remember the name of it, but it does appear to be a brain disease. It's very contagious. Do you know anything about that? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, aware of, of that. Uh, I, I don't have information about it. I can look specifically into it, especially if you can give me a bit more information uh, about it. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Councillor Keevan. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, County Council and Dr. Era. Um, Dr. Era, I'm wondering if you have any information or updates with regards to children under 12 and the uh, potential for them to uh, be eventually vaccinated. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the best of my knowledge and communication that's not uh, uh, final from the ministry, uh, we we're expecting approval of these vaccines uh, later uh, this year. Um, any, anywhere between uh, November and December. Are you good, Councillor Keegan? That's good news. Thank you, Dr. Eric. Thank you. Next, uh, Councillor Sewever. Yes, and I'm um, just following up. But, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious that, you know, as more and more people get vaccinated, um, you know, there will be with the number of cases that uh, happen in them will go up because there's just more of them. Um, but 
is there anywhere where you know where a person can actually see the odds of getting um, hospitalized for vac comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated? Because so often we see the numbers that there's you know X number of cases in un, in fully vaccinated people, but and then there's so many in um, you know unvaccinated. But obviously, as those ratios change and as the number of fully vaccinated goes up, you would expect the ratio to start to tip in favor of more cases in the fully vaccinated just because almost everybody is, as you pointed out. So um, is there anywhere where you can actually see the odds of infection or hospitalization in the two populations? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Public Health Ontario website has uh, plenty of that information. Uh, locally, uh, our data uh, is, is very uh, uh, small and as a sample size, the number of hospitalizations, number of, of even cases. Uh, so inference uh, is not warranted. Uh, a sample size is, is essential to, to make any conclusions about data. Um, but uh, Public Health Ontario would, would have that data. I'll be more than happy to provide it directly if you wish. No, thank you. Very good. Councillor Silver? Yes. Uh, Councillor Potter, you're next. Thank you. And just a little information, and I know the Councillor Desai has put it on the chat, but I think the virus that Councillor Gamble was referring to is known as the Nipah virus, N-I-P-A-H. And uh, there are a lot of fears that it's uh, it might be stronger than, than uh, COVID. So uh, just that little bit of information. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll definitely look into this virus. We, we have in Canada, just to reassure the group, uh, a robust uh, surveillance system uh, that's connected with World Health Organization and Public Health Ontario as well, not just the Public Health Agency of Canada, monitor these diseases and we get signals of them. Uh, for example, for COVID, um, you know, it, 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 earlier reports were late December. Uh, but it wasn't as significant as it was uh, at the time predicted. Uh, nevertheless, when we receive these signals uh, locally, I would definitely look at it, explore it, explore it with academic uh, colleagues. I would explore it with uh, MOHs across the province. Uh, so I have not received anything about this virus. Nevertheless, since it was brought up at this meeting, I will do dil diligence and explore it. Thank you very much. I see no further hands. So with that said, I'll thank you, Dr. Era, for attending today. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Information as always. All right, turning on to our agenda again, we are back. Um, oh, so we sorry. have to clue, don't we? Yes, we do. We have to vote, yes, my, my apologies. So I call the question now on the uh, motion to approve those uh, minutes. Is there anyone opposed? And seeing no hands, I'll say that that is carried. Thank you very much. We're on to item number eight. Uh, and I would just say I would like to push forward as much as quickly as we can because we do have a delegation that was scheduled for 10 a.m. Uh, but with that said, we're on to item number eight, good news and celebrations. Uh, Councillor Soever. Yes, um, so a couple things. Um, our Legion is getting back up and running. Uh, they're, they're hosting events out in their parking lot. And on uh, the 21st of October, they, I mean, sorry, August, they hosted uh, an appreciation barbecue for our first responders, which I was happy to attend along with a couple of our councillors and as well as our member of parliament, Terry Dowdle. Um, so that was a great event, and, and I'm happy to say that two uh, great county paramedics did drop by for uh, a burger at lunch and uh, very much appreciate all the hard work they put in. And that was a great event for uh, hosted by the Legion. The next event at the Legion is September 25th, which is our Oktoberfest. Um, obviously, due to COVID restrictions, it's uh, somewhat smaller than other years, but uh, tickets are available at the Oktoberfest.blue website. Also, yesterday, uh, I was uh, able to, we, along with uh, Mayor McQueen of Great Highlands and Mayor Measures of uh, Clearview, on behalf of the South Georgian Bay Mayor's uh, Caucus, uh, we hosted uh, BJ Than Thangasalam the parliamentary assistant to the Ministry of Transport, as well as senior staff from the ministry. And uh, we had a great day 
touring around the region of South Georgian Bay, uh, looking at traffic issues here. So um, the minister, unfortunately, was unable to attend due to other commitments, but uh, it was a, a great visit. And it did. Uh, we did also highlight um, the traffic issues of, of the entire region, including some of the six and 10 corridor, because uh, you know, obviously we're at the end of the transportation chain emanating out of the GTA. And uh, we were happy to be able to bring some of the traffic issues to senior ministry staff and the um, parliamentary assistance attention. Thank you, Councillor Soever. I was interested to read, I believe, uh, a post with respect to comments um, around uh, Google Maps, uh, uh, perhaps inadvertently directing traffic and creating some uh, uh, some issues for roads that were not designed for that level of uh, traffic. Um, Councillor Desai, you are next. Uh, thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, uh, Greer Highlands uh, has received us uh, uh, as most uh, newest uh, citizen, if you will, uh, Stephanie Stewart and uh, and her husband Nathan Stewart welcomed a baby boy into the world uh, last night. Uh, so hearty congratulations to them, and um, uh, yeah, welcome welcome to the world, Theodore. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to mention, following the uh, August twenty sixth um, committee of the whole, uh, there was some um, comments which I which I I won't repeat here. Uh, but they were certainly a little offensive in nature, and um, I just wanted to mention I'm overwhelmed by the outpour of support uh, from members of the community. Um, I really appreciated that, and uh, and a heartfelt thank you uh, for that. So thank you, thank you very much for indulging this word. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Desai, um, Councillor Clumpus, and then I'll turn to you, Councillor Burley. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Warden, and good morning, uh, County Council. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that um, we had a very successful opening of our brand new Georgian Bay Community School uh, on Tuesday, of course, as with uh, school returning, with uh, well over a thousand students registered and including a uh, surge of new enrollments, of course, the last week just before uh, classes started. And that was, uh, we took that as a certainly a, a testament to the growth in our municipality um, because our building permits have now exceeded uh, 82 and a half million dollars as a new record for us in terms of building uh, permits um, up, uh, for year to date. Uh, happy to see the signs of recovery coming um, and uh, small amounts uh, over the Labor Day weekend has always been a very exciting weekend in our municipality with MIF and uh, the scarecrow invasion of course happening. Um, there is a, a mini scarecrow invasion uh, display at the Big Apple uh, this year uh, to uh, give us a, an advance warning of their 25th anniversary coming up next year. Um, new businesses are coming in and uh, we celebrated uh, uh, over the long weekend with uh, the Canada Day uh, fireworks, which was uh, very, very popular and widely uh, supported. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um... Uh, Councillor Clumpus, I wonder if you might uh, like to highlight one of the 82.5 uh, million in, in builds. Is there one or two projects that you want to mention? Uh, well, certainly, <laughs> certainly our attainable housing and uh, is included in that number. Um, there are a number of uh, projects on the on the way, but uh, we are waiting anxiously for it. Uh, this includes, of course, will with our um, uh, long-term care facility uh, that uh, contributed to it as well. Well underway, uh, that, uh, that vehicle is the uh, long-term care facility on Cook Street and um, other projects are moving along very quickly. Thank you. Very exciting times. Indeed. Uh, next is Council Burley. Thank you, Mr. Worden. Uh, on behalf of myself, Council and all the repairs of Doors and Bus, we would Sincerely like to thank the county for making to uh, adding to the beauty of George and Bus with the newly paved county roads for our municipality. And we really look forward to uh, the new paved roads in 2022. Excellent. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Hutchison, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, County Council. Just a couple of uh, highlights. Uh, I just want to say the Soggy Municipal Airport has a new ground station network. 
Um, this provides uh, our pilots in our coverage area uh, with uh, weather and safety. So we are the only airport in our area that is equipped with this uh, technology and it was all taken care of uh, by the uh, airport uh, various fundraisers that take place. And I also want to say we are pleased to uh, welcome the Landing Gear Diner to the airport, which will be open up uh, later in September. So things are moving forward. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison, that ground station uh, network, is that uh, providing services to only pilots or can pilots access that as well? It's actually it would be an app that you would put on your phone or a uh, uh, piece of equipment that you put in the um, in your aircraft and it's it's not a very expensive uh, item to uh, maintain um, and again it, it is more for the the pilots at, at this at this stage of it thank you sir deputy warden mcqueen you're next uh, thank you uh mr warden and, and county council and just to a couple things uh, just to follow up with uh, uh council Swever with regards to our meeting with the ministry of transportation yesterday uh, it was a very good meeting and just to iterate uh, his comments that one of the biggest parts that uh, I raised and uh, when I was warden raised as well, I was trying to get the minister here and because of COVID it was delayed, but the two regions, central region and southwestern region, most definitely need to talk to each other. And uh, I mean, we had that meeting back in March of, of 2020, just before we in, went into shutdown. But that was the bigger part is, you know, you just can't be silos to each region because of the Southern, Southern Georgian Bay region in, in itself is so integrated between Simcoe and Gray counties that um, and the growth that's happening there right from Wasaga Beach right around to Meaford is, is sort of a, an entity in itself. So that was something that uh, was communicated along with the traffic patterns and we, we did have a, a drive up County Road 91 and talked about that as well. The other part I want to raise, uh, Mr. Warden, is uh, we are planning to have uh, Ram Rodeo come to Gray Highlands on the 25th, 26th, which is uh, in a few weeks. And uh, it's a, excuse me, it's a fundraiser, not only for the opportunity for families to uh, attend an event, uh, certainly it's an outdoor event, so certainly we'll be following all the COVID restrictions and, and all the protocols around that, but certainly it's an opportunity for an event that people have been longing for and and uh, just want to get out and, and, and do something, but also it's a fundraiser for the foundation for the Markdale Hospital, as you're probably aware, um, not only when you build a hospital, you got to put beds and and all that uh, hardware inside. So the foundation is working hard to um, to uh, follow up on on that fundraising of the, uh, and they're going to have a kickoff here later on this fall from the from the uh, fundraising. But this is sort of a, a pre kickoff in the sense of fundraising for that. So if you wish to attend, you can buy tickets online or you can attend uh, both days, uh, uh, both the Saturday and Sunday. And uh, we're hoping for great weather, but certainly rain and shine, the rodeo will go forward unless it's lightning and they take a pause. So who knows, but uh, hopefully it's uh, going to be a successful event and it's a good cause to raise funds for the local Martell Foundation. So thanks again, Mr. Warden and County Council. Thank you, Deputy Warden. And uh, more information and tickets um, available where? Uh, so you can go to... So you could go to the Ram Rodeo. It's a uh, it's, it's a Ram it's the Ram Rodeo across Ontario. So you can look up Ram Rodeo. There's also a Gray Highlands uh, site that's also and, and tickets are you can buy tickets in advance. There's a little bit of a, uh, a savings by buying them in advance. They, they just had the first one and just uh, to iterate that they've been shut down since 2019 themselves. So they had the first Ram Rodeo here in Ontario in Orangeville. Uh, two weeks ago so yeah just look up ram rodeo and uh, it'll it'll direct you and it'll have a a list of all the different uh rodeos that are uh, happening this fall and it'll, it'll show osprey or gray highlands and you can click on there and uh, certainly um, purchase your tickets and uh ticket sales are, are fantastic right now it's amazing and uh just in the sense of the first ram rodeo that was in Rode uh, orangeville they sold out on the saturday and i think which is over 2000, I think on the Sunday, they were around 1700. So great response, great. And we're having great response from the sponsorship because it's the sponsorship that's bringing the rodeo to uh, Gray Highlands. And so uh, I will say that at uh, this time, I've, I'm, have been able to secure enough sponsorship to cover the rodeo. 
And so basically all the gate receipts or all profits will go through the foundation. So it's a, it's a win-win. And so, yeah, come out and support it. Uh, it'd be great. And let's hope for great weather. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's it for uh, good news and celebrations. With that said, we'll turn to item nine, which is uh, the motion for adjournment, which is moved by Councillor O'Leary and seconded by Councillor Woodbury. Um, anyone opposed? Seeing none, that is carried. Thank you very much. We will uh, switch over. Uh, I know recording has stopped, but we have been sitting for an hour. Um, Madam uh, Clerk, would it be okay with our guests um, if we took a short break and, and came back? Do you mind checking that with them? They are with us. Uh, Jessica, is that fine if we if we have a short break and then come back right to your delegation? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. With that said, then, it's now um, uh, 10.30 or 10.31. Why don't we come back at 10.40 sharp? That'll give us nine minutes. I'll see you there.
Okay, Rob. Excellent. I'm taking from that, but we are good to go. Um, I'm looking for quorum. Yes, you have quorum, Mr. Warden. Thank you very much. Okay, so I will call this uh, meeting to order. We're now meeting as Committee of the Whole. Um, <clears throat> is there any declaration of interest, pecuniary or otherwise? Seeing none, I will again uh, ask you to declare if one comes up uh, during the course of the meeting. Uh, item number uh, three is business arising uh, from the minutes, but Councillor um, McQueen, I wonder if I might ask uh, your leave uh, to change it up a little bit so that we can deal with our uh, guests who are here for delegation. They were scheduled for 10 o'clock. Would that be okay with you? Uh, thank you very much. And that said, then we'll turn to item number four, our delegation from the Nuclear Innovation Institute. We welcome Jessica Lindhorn, Director of the Clean Energy Frontier Program, and uh, Chad Richards, Director of the Net Zero Partnerships. And they're talking about preparing for an electric vehicle future. Welcome folks. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I'm going to share my screen um, to get started with our delegation and my colleague, Chad Richards is on the line and he's gonna kick it off for us. Yeah, that's great. Unfortunately, my camera is facing the wrong way. And if in the interest of time, I'm just gonna turn off my camera and use my voice. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Warden and Council. It's great to be here uh, today. Again, following up on a, um, a meeting that I met with uh, I was here before council in, uh, I guess it was last year. It's kind of crazy how time has flown, but uh, to introduce you to, to the Clean Energy Frontier Program, a, a program that we that we have here at the Nuclear Innovation Institute. Uh, the program is now led by, by Jessica Linthorne, my colleague here today. Um, and I'm heading up a new program over at, at the Nuclear Innovation Institute. But today we're here to talk about a report that the Clean Energy Frontier Program uh, conducted earlier this year uh, called uh, Plugging in why Bruce Gray and Huron must prepare for an electric vehicle future. And just because, you know, think the stars all aligned today is actually World EV Day. So, you know, it's very timely that we're here today to talk about this um, and, you know, why, why these discussions around electric vehicles uh, matter. So to that point, our, um, our, our report, as I mentioned, uh, plugging in, was led by uh, the Nuclear Innovation Institute's Clean Energy Frontier Program. And we partnered with, uh, with Plug and Drive, which is a, a leader in the EV industry. They have a very strong network of current EV drivers and you know, give us really a lot of opportunities to tap into the sentiments of people who are currently driving uh, EVs. Um, and really why we're here to talk to you uh, as, a, as a municipal government today, it, it, there's, it's really twofold. One, we've seen municipalities and municipal governments uh, be active in the, uh, the installation of EV charging infrastructure. And we want to make sure that, you know, as if, if uh, municipal governments around our region are considering, you know, continuing to be active in installing EV infrastructure, that those decisions are backed up by really solid data on where these charging stations have the most impact. And the second, the second opportunity is really that it becomes an economic development opportunity. And, you know, I look at things like Gray County's uh, climate change action plan, you know, the, these are things that the, you as a municipality are active in. And we want to make sure that, you know, as you move forward in this space, that these decisions, you have all available data uh, that's out there available to you and, and making really truly informed decisions. So to give some further context on why this matters to our region here in Bruce Gray and Huron, which we call the, we, we like to call the clean energy frontier region, um, is it really that our region depends on tourism. So for, for years, residents of Bruce Gray and Huron have traveled uh, to and from work in their cars. So, it, you know, as a vast rural region, it's not just people driving to the region. Once you're here, you have to drive to and from work. It's just a, the nature of living in a vast rural area. And also, our visitors to the region largely arrive here the same way. They drive. And the, but in that in that space, a shift is underway. The governments are now opposing uh, imposing deadlines to eliminate the sale of internal combustion engines. You know, I, I like to say again, our timing is just majestic with this report. The day that our report was released was actually the same day that the government of Canada um, announced uh, a new uh, a new requirement or a, a new target of having 100% of internal combustion passenger 
vehicle sales be uh, be zero emission by the year 2035. So these gov governments are moving forward in this direction and trying to influence change. And it's not just governments that are imposing these deadlines and you know, making these targets and, and promises. The, the auto industry itself is, is banking on an all electric future. And that's really a critical thing that we haven't seen in the past. There's been a lot of talk about EVs and targets and where they could go, but the auto industry has taken notice and they've put consumers on notice. I look at uh, you know, Ford uh, in, in, a, in a conversation about the future of the industry, their CEO said that electric vehicles are the biggest opportunity for Ford since Henry Ford scaled the Model T. Uh, GM, which has committed to an all electric uh, future by 2035 in line with those targets um, has said uh, they have a zero crashes zero emissions and zero congestion plan and they their ceo has you know made it very clear that they want to put everyone they want to be part of the solution to uh, climate change by putting everyone in an in an electric vehicle and those those two things the government government imposed deadlines and auto industry taking note is influencing change in the passenger vehicle industry. So uh, despite the pandemic where we saw vehicle sales uh, around the world largely decline, 2020 became a record year for EV sales around the world. And so largely what this all boils down to is that if you look at where we're headed in the passenger vehicle uh, industry, you know, it would be interesting to see, you know, no gas stations available to people driving internal combustion engines. So it all results in the fact that EV drivers are going to need access to public charging infrastructure. Thanks for that, Chad, for kicking us off. So what we did um, as the start of this study is we did have to do a real stock taking and having a close look at the charging infrastructure that is in place in the Tri-County region. Um, and, and actually, in fact, within the report, we do mention, we give a bit of a shout out to the city of Olin Sound um, for their commitment for the public access charging. And so we do see that we've got chargers behind the farmer's market. And, um, and that's what we'd like to see more of. So here's a bit of a stock take. We're in, we're in really good shape. There's good infrastructure in place. So having a look at the, the data, what we did see, we did survey drivers through plug and drive, um, and we did see that these statistics here. So we are getting an understanding of who these drivers are in Southwestern Ontario. And with that, we're learning to what their expectations are. So having a look at our current EV drivers and asking where they're taking their EVs. So what we see here, these statistics, they're long weekend trips, about 56.5% of these EV drivers take that EV on their long weekend. 55% are taking them for day trips and our road trips is, is about four evenings or more um, when we talk about road trips. So 37.5% are using their EVs and certainly it matters where they're going and they're doing the research to understand where they can get that charge. So absolutely understanding that 70% told us they will only choose or give preference where they know they can get a public charge. This statistic is alarming to us, understanding we, with that stock taking, we do have good infrastructure here, but still 83% of drivers think it would be difficult or very difficult to get a charge in the Tri-County region. Having a closer look at what drivers do want, what we have heard from the, 528 drivers in, in Ontario, they're looking for that level three, 41% of these drivers are looking for that level three highway stop. And I like to consider this one as almost that traditional uh, gas station. You pull over, you get fuel, you keep going. Your level three is a fast charge. You're looking for that highway stop charge. 36% are looking for that on street near an attraction downtown. And again, you know what Owen Sound has done with the downtown um, location at the farmer's market, being able to land there, have your level two while maybe you go out for lunch, and 13% looking for that level two at an overnight accommodator. So again, just as we hear more and more about EVs and chargers and public charging, what does all of this mean? This is just a slide to give you a bit of context on your level one. So that's what we would see at home when we're plugging in. So it does take about an hour for your eight kilometer um, right up to your level three. So again, looking at that fast, that fast charge. Level two is a nice leisurely able to go to a restaurant, maybe visit the farmer's market or an art gallery while you're downtown um, and, and that level two charge. So with that, um, I'm gonna pass it back to Chad to kick us off. We do have seven recommendations and so we'll walk through these and then we'll look forward to answering any questions. Chad, did you wanna lead us off?
Madam Clerk, is Chad still on the call? I see he is not on the call. Oh, shoot. Okay, that's no problem. I can take over for him. Okay. Um, he must be having a technical difficulty. Um, so let's continue through here. So our, our recommendations, so developing a clear and coordinated strategy, certainly. Um, and this collaboration is really important. We know that collaboration is important when we find these efficiencies and reduce some costs. So keeping this opportunity in mind, looking at um, sharing our local expertise with EV technology is really better understanding. So there is lots of work happening right now, the evolution of batteries and understanding how this fits into a gray Bruce Huron winter, um, understanding what this could look like in our environment. Focusing on public charging infrastructure. So as I mentioned that 41, over 41% are looking for this level three highway stop where you're, you're able to get that quick charge. So really keeping this in mind as we're moving forward with infrastructure. Um, again, you know, we think about our economic development offices in the Tri-County, and we have great partnerships with our local BIAs, with our Chambers of Commerce, so we're, and our businesses. Continuing to do that is really important. Again, working collaboratively, um, being strategic and in installing those level two chargers so that there's that economic development opportunity for these drivers. Um, five is really interesting. Recommendation five is continuing our partnerships working together. Wellington County has had real success in the work that they're doing, and there's a good network now of counties that are joining forces to continue um, to build that thoughtful charging station, that thoughtful network. Um, and Wellington County has been using some of our data that we've collected through this report, which is, is wonderful to see. So again, going back to that alarming statistic, 85% feel that it's difficult or very difficult to get a charge. So our recommendation, we do need to continue to market our area. We have infrastructure. We're continuing to make investments in infrastructure. We need to make sure that drivers in south, southern Ontario recognize they can come up to Grey Bruce Huron and they can get a charge while they're up here. And then lastly, seven is, again, is creating awareness with our local businesses, lo uh, specific local mechanics, really helping um, the industry understand that this shift is coming. Um, we have, you know, as Chad mentioned early in the delegation, we have um, deadlines imposed now. We're seeing manufacturers take this leap. So it is coming and um, we want to make sure that our local businesses are aware and successful. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And thank you very much for having us join you today. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. I wonder if we could uh, <clears throat> go back to the... Thank you. I will note Mr. Warden, Chad has rejoined us. Oh, and we can see you. Yeah, Welcome back. My apologies, my apologies, Warden. It's been a brutal morning for tech, I guess. <laughs> no worries at all. We have lots of questions from folks, so starting with Councillor Desai. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Warden. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jessica and Chad, for the uh, um, for the presentation. A um, few questions I have. Um, the first one is. Uh, with regards to EV tourism, uh, can you expand a little further on that? Um, I know you had quite a few statistics. Um, my question on that is how does EV tourism complement Gray County's climate, uh, climate change action plan? Uh, that's my first question. I do have two other questions after that. Thank you. Thank you, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for the question. We had, so I will let you know, we did have a really great meeting uh, with your manager of climate change initiative, Linda, um, and a couple other people on Gray County staff to really to compliment the work that the team's doing on the climate change action plan. And within that action plan, we did note there is mention of EV tourism and recognizing the, the shift into electric vehicles. So we think that the data we're, we br we're bringing forward really is an opportunity for municipalities to make an informed choice. So as you are looking at investing in infrastructure, as your economic development teams may be doing outreach to traditional gas stations or traditional um, businesses, um, helping understand this data and what these EV drivers want um, we hope that that will be helpful and complementary to the work that your team is doing. Thank you very much. Um, my next question is, and, and perhaps this is not the right uh, place for this question, so feel free to tell me if, if that is the case. Um, the, what is the cost of installing a, a level three uh, charger 
Um, and one of the things that I'm very passionate about is asset management. So what would be the level of uh, maintenance that is then required on, on a regular basis to ensure that the EV charges don't fail um, in, in Gray County? At least. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Warden. So what we are doing right now is sort of a phase two of this project is we are going back to plug and drive and asking for a little bit more detail on that. So I do appreciate that question and I will share, we've made this delegation to uh, Bruce County and Huron County Council as, as well. And it's a common question that does come up. So we're looking forward to finding a little bit more about the cost of that infrastructure to help support a business case for that install. So as we find some of these average costs for install, and uh, some of this average revenue, because there is revenue associated, um, we're hoping to, to compile some further data and we will certainly share that with Gray County. Yeah, and if I may, if I may, if I may build on that, you know, there, there is uh, presently uh, funds from the federal government available to, yeah. to support those installations. Uh, the zero emission vehicle infrastructure, infrastructure program is funded out to 2024. I mean, nobody can predict the results of an election and what might happen if if there were a change of government but uh, at present NRCAN has a program to support that and municipal, municipal governments are eligible recipients of that funding so you know it's I guess to highlight that uh, municipal governments aren't on their own in this uh, in this transition and that funds exist to support those installs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry I, I do have one yep. final uh, bit. Thank you Warden Hanks. Um, in December of 2019, uh, the Ontario Legislature passed Bill 123, I believe it was, uh, which um, it, protect, it reserved uh, spaces for, or reserved charging spaces for electric vehicles only, um, which to me was a, um, a positive for EV, uh, a, a minor victory perhaps. Um, is there um, further advocacy that, that uh, you would be looking for uh, for further uh, benefits for uh, electric uh, or EVs. Um, the last question I have, and this ties into tourism a little bit again, is there a central uh, inventory available online for um, determining uh, where uh, the charging, station ex charging stations exist? Um, that's my final bit. And I will just say that uh, this, uh, the presentation was uh, electrifying. Could oh, you? Resist, I could you? <laughs> I, I will say, I, Jess rolls her eyes every time we talk about this stuff because I, I just break out the puns nonstop. So um, they, they, yeah, they, they drive themselves. Um, so <laughs> um, uh, to, to your last question, uh, through you, Warden, to, to Councillor Desai, um, there is a, the, the report itself used, um, used publicly available information on a website known as Charge Hub. Uh, which has kind of been the industry recognized uh, central place where EV charging stations are recognized. Uh, the content is, uh, you know, both verified by Charge Hub and uh, user generated. So if you see a charging station, you can actually, when you use it, uh, you know, identify if it's, uh, you know, not working at the time. And it, it basically has a feed in loop from people who are using the charging stations. So, um, and then in terms of, you know, other EV advocacy, I think that it's important to note the, the report itself kind of, kind of says that this this transition is coming you know when we were talking about 2035 you know that is that is 14 years away but i think that the the, the thing to highlight is that the sooner we start the sooner um the, the the more prepared we are for a future that is really at this point you know by all industry accounts inevitable um so and and really i think there the report does have a, a heavy focus on ev tourism and obviously you know just given lower rates of adoption here in the region but that said you know our residents of the region will soon be driving an increasing share of EV. So I think that there is a there's a service to residents and taxpayers here as well down the road. Down the road. There you go. I'll end with a pun. That's it, Councillor Desai. Uh, that, that will be all. Uh, thank you, Warden. Thanks. Thank you. And by the number of hands I see up, I can see that this is a very easy conversation to get plugged into. Uh, Councillor Gamble, you're next. Okay. Thank you, Warden. Um, I, I'm definitely in favor of nuclear energy. I don't want to sound negative on this, but uh, where I work, I work with batteries a lot, and I just don't see, unless there's a lot of new technology in battery life here in uh, Gray County, they will not survive the winter. We have items of, of problems with them consistently all winter long. And I heard the other day that they're talking about putting heaters on the batteries. 
which of course just uses more energy. So my, my concern is that they don't, you know, the whole thing is exciting, the charging stations, whatnot, but let's get the technology solid behind it before we move on. And, and that's a major concern for my, my business agriculture. We have a lot of big equipment that take batteries and I just don't see how electric's gonna, I know John Deere has tried to make a, a, a retro, but it's not working out well. Uh, we need a lot of help in this technology. Thank you. Thank you. Any comment on that, Jessica or Chad? Um, I can make a quick comment. I think you know, for in the passenger in the passenger vehicle space, uh, I I think that there's a difference between the passenger vehicle space and the heavy vehicle space. Uh, heavy vehicles for sure, because you need a much larger battery to power the vehicle um, and you know, installing infrastructure around to keep the battery warm or safe from conditions gets uh, to be, a, you, you, really, you really drive down efficiency. The larger the battery, the, the heavier the machine is, the less efficient it is. But in the passenger vehicle space, I think we're seeing a lot of advancements. I mean, I'm not a battery engineer or technologist by any means, but uh, you know, th there is really a, an emergency Emerging space of, uh, of battery technology that's that, that batteries are getting more efficient, more uh, conditioned to winters. There's new technologies coming out, I swear, every day. Um, and really, I think that it's it, it's moving in the right direction. And uh, I think that you know, I think the writing is really on the wall that you have, um, you know, it's not just, you know, governments making these hopeful promises that the EV industry will win the day. It's the auto industry saying the EV industry is winning the day. And by 2035, we're not making the internal combustion engines anymore. So that's, and that's, I think, you know, the dire warning from, from the auto industry and why we're saying, you know, getting, starting, starting the conversation now and getting prepared now is all, all the more important with those warnings from the, the auto industry itself. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Keaveny, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you to uh, Jessica and Chad. Um, in your report, you suggested 86% of current EV drivers would suggest that it's difficult to, uh, to get a charge here in, uh, Ray County, for example. So in an ideal world, how many stations should we have at this point in time that would uh, meet the needs of the current number of uh, EV drivers? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, that's a very good question. And I, I don't have a particular answer. Um, and Chad, I'm not sure if you do either. Um, but I do think that the understanding really of the the, I think more so the alarming with that 83% thinking it's difficult or very difficult. It may just be that assumption of, oh, Gray Bruce, you're on, oh, up that way. Um, you know, if I go up to, to Blue Mountain or if I go to Owen Sound or over to Sable Beach, I, I'm probably not going to get a charge because it's a bit of a, um, an assumption that maybe we're just, we're not ready. Um, so I can't comment on how we are doing in regards to are we meeting a threshold or an expectation? Um, I do see those numbers and I know the conversations with Chad and with Plug and Drive are, this is very good. Um, you know, we are doing okay. Um, Chad, did you have anything to add in regards to specifics? I'm not sure we have those projections. Yeah, um, I would just, I would add on to that um, through you, Warden. Um, that it's, I think it's less about a number and more about stations in impactful locations that this report emphasizes. So, you know, if you're going to install stations, they, they should be in places that are, you know, convenient and, and make sense for somebody driving an EV. And that will, that will have a bigger impact on the perception of the, the, e, the ease at which you can charge in the region than just a sheer number. I don't think that, um, that just, just, you know, having 200 is the, the answer. It's a matter of making sure that there's a strategic network of chargers that can get you from point A to point B in the region. Um, and I think that's really, that's part of the work that's getting, that's undergoing, uh, that's being undertaken by, but led by Wellington. I, and I know Gray County is part of that uh, initiative as well, making sure that there is this seemingly corridor of charging stations that will really provide an impact. And I think once more initiatives like that and more chargers are in place in places that actually make sense to charge at, then you'll 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 see perception uh, improve. Thank you, Councillor Potter. You're next. Thank you, and and uh, I I will risk being the outsider here, but uh, as much as I am all in favor of cleaner energy, uh, I keep wondering why it's always the municipal taxpayers that are being asked to foot the bill for this. Uh, we've had several proposals in our own municipality. Uh, you know, the people that are making the money from this are the power industry, the uh, automotive industry, and so on. 
Uh, I'm not sure why private enterprise isn't jumping into this if it's such a great promise for the future. And my, my problem is that the municipal taxpayer is going to be on the hook for this for who knows how long. Uh, and uh, with, with uh, no end in sight. So I just wonder why, why private enterprise is it jumping onto this and, and seeing the possibilities. Any comment there? Yeah, it's three, Mr. Ward. And so, yeah, thank you very much for the, the comment. And, and this is certainly a conversation that has come up with our conversations with county councillors. Um, and so what we see is right now, we see municipal governments installing chargers and we're hopeful that our data can help municipalities as they continue that work to make informed decisions. Um, Chad did mention um, granting money available. It's quite generous, um, so there is that availability. So we do, we do remind the municipalities that you know this isn't necessarily coming from your tax base. This could be an opportunity to to leverage that funding. And then I guess I'll I'll close as well with saying that when we think about economic development, uh, Chad and I had a conversation this morning. Um, there's there's lots of opportunity to go and have that do that traditional the business retention and expansion interviews with your traditional gas stations, with owners and operators in your communities and ask if there's some, if there's a way you can support them as they transition to charging stations rather than using gas. So there's different conversations that can be, can be started. Um, but for now, you know, our, our data is really the opportunity to share with the municipalities because we do see municipalities in this space of installing chargers. I, I agree that, that uh, helping to coordinate this and facilitate it might be a good role for a municipality, but I remind you that those grant programs at the federal and provincial level are paid for by the same taxpayers that pay our taxes. Mm -hmm. So there's no real advantage to that. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Councilor Mill, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, I, I share... Um, Councillor Gamble's concern uh, as an old farmer running some old equipment, it's, it's, it drives a bit of anxiety here. I, I have trouble now finding a mechanic that knows what a carburetor is or how to set a set of points on a gas motor, but this is only going to make it worse. But nonetheless, the whole discussion <clears throat> here this morning has sparked a question. <laughs> okay, you got that. Good. Um, is, is the is the grid infrastructure, the basic grid infrastructure in Grey Bruce Huron ready for all these charging stations? Uh, I mean, I read um, articles saying that it is and others say it is. Do you folks have any insight into that? Um, you know, without, uh, through you, Mr. Warden, without, uh, you know, preempting conversations with uh, our friends at West Area and Hydro One, um, I think that, for level, for instance, for level two charging stations, they're they're essentially a plug and play type exercise. They can be installed without massive uh, upgrades to to the grid. Um, with respect to level three stations, uh, they do require a bit more work. That's which is why they're more expensive uh, uh, to to tap them into the into the grid itself. I mean, conversations about grid resilience, we'd have to we'd have to take offline. I don't know if I can speak confidently to that today. Very good, thank you. Um, Randy, you're next. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Warden. And, and first, I just want to thank um, uh, Jessica and Chad for their presentation today. Um, as they noted, we've recently had an opportunity to meet with them. Uh, we see a lot of opportunity to partner and collaborate with the Nuclear Innovation Institute on implementing the Gray County Climate Change Action Plan once that's finalized. Um, we've also shared the action plan with them for their review and comments, so uh, we look forward to, to some of their feedback with respect to that document. Um, <clears throat> with respect to electric vehicles, um, uh, as has been noted, um, Council uh, has committed to that partnership with Wellington County, Dufferin, Perth, Huron, Graber's Public Health and the City of Guelph. Uh, to apply for funding to complete that regional EV charging network feasibility study. So with the information that Nuclear Innovation Institute has, has provided as, as well as that study, that will 
provide us with some uh, really good information in terms of where we should strategically locate uh, our EV charging infrastructure that's been flagged as a, a, a strategy and action in our climate change action plan. Um, so we hope to hear whether or not we're successful in receiving that funding in the next few weeks. Uh, if not, we think there's interest amongst the collective to potentially move forward with the project because uh, we see that there's great need to move forward with that. Of course, that would be subject to budget approval. Um, the Nuclear Innovation Institute has been plugged in with this partnership, sorry, continuing with the, the puns, and the, and the results from this study, as I mentioned, along with that, the work that they've completed will, will just help to inform where, where we should be strategically locating uh, these, uh, these charging stations. Um, with respect to the question uh, regarding, um, and just sorry, just finding in terms of, I made some notes, uh, in terms of the the costs of, of the EV infrastructure and um, uh, and who should pay for that. Um, we do see for sure uh, the municipalities and the county playing a role in, in terms of coordinating uh, where these should strategically be located. Um, we do see there's opportunities to partner with some of those um, uh, private uh, uh, energy companies and others. And we've already had some preliminary discussions with folks like uh, Enbridge uh, uh, slash Union Gas uh, and others to see if there's opportunities to partner with them uh, on on creating that infrastructure throughout uh, throughout the county. So, and there may be other opportunities as well that we will for sure explore uh, to make sure that uh, from a funding perspective, it's not completely on the backs of of uh, existing. Uh, taxpayers. So I just wanted to raise that point as well. And with respect to the um, the overall uh, infrastructure and whether or not uh, our, our grid can handle, uh, that's, that's something we can uh, explore further with, of course, our our manager of climate change initiatives, Linda Swanson and others to, to explore that further. And we're happy to work with Nuclear Innovation Institute to find out more information about that and bring that back uh, uh, and inform council with respect to that. So again, thank you for your presentation, Jessica and Chad, and we look forward to, to working with you uh, in the future for sure. Thank you, uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, branching out, and sorry, I don't have any puns to go with the branching out other than when branches fall on wires, don't touch them. But um, I'm wondering if Jessica or Chad, if you have any knowledge or like throughout your uh, networking of the construction housing building industry, are they um, putting the plugins when they build the new houses? For you, Mr. Warden um, and Chad, I'm not sure if you have an additional comment to this, but I, I can share that in conversations with uh, utility um, providers, we have had a bit of that conversation and I think it's a really curious question to ask our developers and our home builders. Um, I certainly expect that if it's if it's something that you opt for as a new home builder. Um, however, I'm not sure that it's, it's happening in all new builds. Chad, do you have any more information on that? Um, with respect to to building, uh, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure there are there are different initiatives out there to encourage uh, home charging stations. That said, I'd, I'd highlight that the technology itself, you know, an, an at home overnight level one charging station, uh, you know, every EV comes with a at home charger that it plugs into a wall outlet. So, I mean, you can charge at home. It's just much slower. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Councillor Potter, you're next. Thank you. Just following up on Councillor Patterson's question, if I could put this through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to uh, to Randy, uh, could we require that in subdivision agreements that uh, new home builds include the infrastructure, uh, even though it may not be as good, uh, include the infrastructure for uh, charging stations in the homes? That would solve a lot of the problem. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, uh, it, it's a great question, and I think it it builds into one of the uh, proposed strategies and actions in our in our draft climate change action plan in terms of creating a, a green building um, standard um, that we could implement through things like new new development, new subdivisions through subdivision agreements, etc. Um, and one of them could be with respect to making sure that at least the uh, infrastructure is there for someone that be, can add 
uh, an EV charging um, uh, plug-in uh, easily. Uh, so that's something that we can definitely explore further um, uh, with as part of that green uh, building standard that is being proposed in our climate change action plan for sure. Thank you, Councillor Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you very much for the presentation this morning. Very interesting. I would like to comment that the Georgian Bluffs um, Climate Action Committee, one of our recommendations that we'll be going forward to our council is that we ask in our building department that they put in that we request in all new builds that there be the rough in for electric charging stations so that the basic infrastructure is in place in all new builds going forward. So then the resident, whoever owns the property, proceeds with whatever infrastructure they need to put onto that, but just as a way of building that right into our building code at the township. Thank you. Thank you, I see no further hands. Um, so Jessica, when you presented, you talked about um, uh, possibility of indoor uh, warm sort of charging uh, stations. Uh, are there any examples of that? I would think that someone enterprising, as Councilor Potter said, uh, would be thinking about a business case for that, maybe a car wash combined with an indoor uh, charging facility. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I don't have an example of that at hand, but certainly in our conversations with plug and drive, we're always curious and asking um, these industry experts about these things. So, so maybe, Chad, maybe that's something that we can add to our conversation unless Chad has something to add. Yeah, absolutely, Jess. I think there, there's out of our conversations with um, with county councils in the region, there's definitely going to be some form of follow up to this. There's a lot of great questions that that municipal governments are asking, and certainly, you know, validated why why we should be coming and talking to to county councils as well. We're getting a lot of great feedback on this. Um, to the question of you know existing infrastructure, I'm not. Uh, I can't speak confidently that there is something of uh, you know a good example to point to. That said, I would I would highlight that. You know, coming back to that question of why isn't the private private sector getting involved in this? They absolutely are. Um, Circle K has you know made a, a, a huge effort to ramp up EV installations. Um, there's a, the on route uh, system is becoming you know a, a, another area where they're looking at EV charging infrastructure and new innovations in EV charging infrastructure. So I think that you know just as we as we move down the road uh, towards towards 2035, you're going to see more examples of that of, of these innovative charging infrastructure pieces pop up. Right. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. You'll have the final word. I was just going to say that I know a, a, a local uh, car wash baron has uh, seriously considered about uh, installing uh, various uh, means to charge electric vehicles. But on the other hand, I'm thinking an electrical cord into the side of a vehicle and spraying water all over the place, what could go wrong? Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's all I had. Thank you. Right. It'd be shocking to say the least. Um, all right. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Very current. <laughs> Right, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Obviously, a uh, very engaging uh, conversation. It's got us all charged up. And I want to thank you, Jessica and Chad, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. All right. That was a lot of fun, actually. Um, I do enjoy the puns. We're back to item number uh, three now. <laughs> I could see the smoke coming out of some ears, actually. <laughs> People trying to think of these puns. Uh, we're back to item number three, which is a notice of motion by uh, Councillor McQueen, uh, seconded by Councillor Mackey. Uh, so, Councillor McQueen, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden and County Council. And uh, I think pretty, pretty much the uh, notice of motion is pretty self-explanatory, as we have known in the past that uh, this area does have is underserviced and. Uh, I felt it's sort of prudent that we do bring a report to sort of uh, look at it closer and, and bring some recommendations back. I know other areas over the years have uh, have had increase in services. I know with regards to Chatsworth and Southgate, and I think even with the Blue Mountains with regards to the Ski Hill have increased services. So again, I think it was has, well, definitely has been identified as an underservice area. So I don't know if there's any other questions, but uh, certainly uh, hope I get the support from County Council to Bring a report back. Thank you. Okay, any questions? 
comments. So, Madam CAO. Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry about that. I wonder if council would be okay if Kevin McNabb made a couple of comments. Oh, absolutely. Kevin? Morning, Warden County Council. Uh, I guess I just uh, asked uh, your permission just to make a suggestion. Um, we've never done this before in Gray County. Um, I've been here since 2004. And uh, I know a number of other uh, municipalities, paramedic services have done this. They've went to an external consultant and where they've looked at uh, call volumes, you know, growth in population area, if we're best position and stuff like that. And then also even in consideration of new models of care that are coming up and other, you know, means of uh, delivering service. If something would that be more prudent instead of looking at just one area of the county is to look at our system as a whole. It's something we could budget for in 2022 and uh, do early in 2022. Uh, again, I just put that out for consideration and that way we would you know, have a wholesome look, not just in the first next year or two, but also we could go out like 10 years and grow. We've seen significant call volume increases. We're seeing increases in population. And we do have areas that are, you know, that are, you know, with distance is a problem for us. But I think to bring all those metrics together under the review of an expert, I think would be very good. Any other comments? Uh, Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I, uh, I concur with uh, Mr. McNabb. I think that would be a very good idea to get a wholesome look of the whole county. But my question uh, directly to uh, Kevin is, do you, do you have any idea what the cost might be? Yeah, I, I think you're probably in the uh, 40 to $50,000 for something like that. I haven't asked the different sizes. It may be less. I don't think it'd be much more, but uh, like it, it may be less. I just, uh, that's just off the top of my head. But I guess the thing is when we put a, a vehicle in somewhere for 24 hours, you want to have the biggest impact. Like that's 1.4 million every year. And uh, like just to have that direct guidance, uh, you know, just having all that fulsome look. And I think that planning, I think would help me too, you know, having that expert that, uh, again, we, we know our area of the best, but, you know, we can bring that information to them, but to have them lay it over all that other, information and, and, and data I think will be very helpful. Thank you. And, and just as a follow-up, if I might, Mr. Warden, I presume or would presume that any study of that nature would uh, encompass uh, coverage from any of our neighbors that would encroach into Great County as well, would it not? I'm thinking Wellington County serves the, the bottom, the southwest corner of the, of yeah, the county. I think that that could be looked at. Um, I think the thing is, and, and we do have, you know, primarily we, we, we do have areas that respond into the county, just like we responded to other counties. Right. So we, because of the, the different municipalities, just because there's a car in a certain municipality doesn't mean it's not sitting halfway somewhere into their municipality. It makes it another 10 or 15 kilometers. We, we can't always rely upon it. So we, we try not to make those decisions based upon that. But right. it, it, it is a consideration. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to call the question? Does everyone have their say? Is that, oh, Councillor McQueen and Councillor McQueen. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, certainly uh, I'm not opposed to getting a, a, a broad base um, report back. And, uh, and that could come through recommendations from this notice of motion that that comes through and maybe there's a bit of a high level or, or a bit of a gray county uh, status up to here, and then maybe that's the recommendations to go further. I will say that uh, yesterday when we were, I, and I think uh, Councillor Miller makes a really good point with regards to our bordering areas, because uh, I know, uh, you know, with regards to the Great Highlands and, and the Blue Mountains, there is um, what they call the escarpment. And not only, not all roads run north, south, east, west because of uh, physical challenges and, and uh, Land, landscapes, but it was interesting yesterday when we were in our tour with the MTO and uh, we had stopped at Collingwood to have a chat with the ministry and lo and behold, there was an ambulance uh, noise and as it went by uh, the um, trying to get a, uh, Metro, that's where we were parked, was a Gray County EMS heading, I presume, to the Collingwood Hospital. So there isn't a lot of overlap of our bordering areas uh, all around Gray County. And uh, certainly 
that would be something that from that broad base of how that works and, and bill service deliveries and how that's working. But uh, I just brought up that, that note is just something we saw yesterday. And uh, certainly it's, uh, as we know, with, uh, as we do have our, our aging uh, population, as we know, 30% between 56 and uh, 75 right now, as that moves forward, the timing and response time is, is very, very important and moving forward will continue to be very important, for, especially from a sector or a cohort that is entering into a more substantive, uh, I guess, uh, area of health that may be put more demand on our system. I just say that in general, but uh, anyway, uh, those are some of my comments, Mr. Warden. Thank you. So we, um, Councillor Mill. Thank you. I'm just wondering, um, Madam CEO, what manner of amendment to this would you like to see to accommodate Kevin's uh, ask, I guess? Okay. Like I, I don't see in this motion uh, directly, like I, I'm not opposed to the motion itself, but I, yes. I, I do like Kevin's uh, suggestion. Yes. So I'm just wondering what sort of amendment. Yeah. I think with, with council support, um, this could be amendment to uh, staff be directed to complete um, further analysis on potential uh, coverage opportunities um, across Gray County and then bring back a report. So Madam Clerk, uh, thank you, Madam CAO for that. So Madam Clerk, if, if uh, it's agreeable, I would uh, propose that amendment to the motion. That's fine. Actually, that's what I was, Kim fine. took the words right out of my mouth. Um, I didn't know also because there was discussion about including this in the 2022 budget, if that would be an additional clause for council's consideration that this item be included in part of the 2022 budget um, discussions. Um, if you're uh, agreeable to including that, uh, Councillor Millen as the mover. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I'm looking for a seconder for that uh, motion. Uh, Councillor Clumpus seconds and the discussion on the amendment. If that's the case, then we'll call the question on the amend amendment. Anyone opposed? Seeing none, the amendment carries. I guess we don't need, Madam um, Clerk, we don't need to vote on the main motion now, do we? We do need to vote on the main motion because it's just that's the second amendment. clause that has been amended. Correct, okay. Uh, so uh, we're dealing now with the uh, main um, the main motion as amended and uh, Deputy Warden McQueen. Yeah, thank you. And, and sort of zeroing in on the part of, of the underserviced areas that uh, uh, definitely need to, to be identified and, and addressed. But I think there's lots of different ways. I think our, our Director of AMS, uh, Mr. McNabb, has talked about uh, what's the plan or moving of, of EMS uh, vehicles themselves, or they, they do move out and, you know, definitely as an example with, uh, certainly with the, we have this rodeo coming up at the end of the month, we certainly will be in, uh, notifying the uh, Gray County EMS that this event's coming on. So they see that they know there's certain flexibility and all that. So I just raise that part as, is there's a lot of possibilities and I know Kevin has spoken to that as well so it's just addressing you know those underserviced areas in the sense of how do you address that in certain times and hours and you try to always move to a better place for response time and I think there's a lot of possibilities here and I just say that more in general so thank you. Anything to add to that Kevin otherwise we'll call the question. Right. Oh, okay. No I, I think that's correct like there's lots of considerations in this, but I think this would be a way to look at the system as a whole and bring it all together under one. And, uh, and, and, and our, our goal at the end of the day is to have our, the fastest response time, the most efficient as possible. Thank you. Okay, it's time to call the question. Is there anyone opposed uh, to the motion as it has been amended? I see no hands, so it carries. Thank you very much. Okay, we're down now. Sorry, did I miss something? No? Okay, we're down now to item number five and dealing with the consent uh, agenda. And then I'm gonna suggest as Councillor Desai has requested that we take a break before we get into um, item seven. So is there anything that needs to be uh, pulled from the consent agenda? Uh, Councillor Soever. 
Yes, I'd like to pull item B, the uh, report on the Clarksburg Dome. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other hands. So with that said, I'm going to um, the consent agenda has been moved by Councillor Plumpus and seconded by Councillor Robinson. Anyone opposed to that? And so it's been amended with item B pulled out. No hands, so it is carried. Thank you very much. So we will take uh, a break. <clears throat> it's now 11.30. Can we come back at 11.40? We're good with that. 11.40, we'll see you there, Sharp.
Let's see, robbery back. Looking for quorum. I don't think we have it yet. Not quite. There we go. There we go. Excellent. Welcome back, everyone. A second here. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. We're now on to item 7A. Uh, corporate financial update and year end projection as of June 30th, 2021. We have Mary Lou and uh, Sue on deck. Uh, this item has been moved by Councillor Robinson and uh, seconded by Councillor Mackey. Mary Lou and Sue. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. This report provides a financial update based on financials to June 30th with a projection to the end of the year. The motion also refers to the Gray Roots General Store construction budget shortfall that was discussed in the quarterly purchasing report FRCW 1521. As the purchasing report did not request a motion for the means of funding the shortfall, that motion is included in the resolution for this report. So the report provides dialogue in each functional area, hitting the highlights of significant items in the respective budgets. Attached to the report is a numerical summary broken down into the operating capital budgets. At this point, staff projects an operating deficit of 290,700 and a capital surplus of $679,000 for an overall combined surplus of $388,300. And just as a means of comparison, the 2021 levy is $62.3 million. So the current projected surplus represents 0.62% of the levy. The next financial update will be based upon September financials and is scheduled to be presented to committee on November 12th. So highlights from the report are as follows. For the administration budget, a $294,400 operating surplus is projected largely a result of staffing vacancies and changes, reductions in staff training, conferences, travel, et cetera. Investment income is projected to end the year $356,300 under budget. This will not result in a shortfall as the transfer to reserve will be reduced or could be offset by the use of COVID funding if it's available. The ITA capital budget will have a shortfall of approximately $30,320. And this is discussed in a staff report later in the agenda. Staff proposes using information services surplus and this will result in a $6,000 shortfall as a result of one capital project that came in over budget. Council is projected to have a $78,000 surplus as the result of virtual meetings and lower expenses for travel means and accommodations. The information services budget, as I mentioned under administration, is expected to have savings that will offset the IT capital budget. And after this is taken into account, a $3,100 surplus is projected. Weekly indemnity and workers' compensation budgets, both of these budgets are self-insured plans. HR staff calculates premiums to be charged out to departments based on best estimates and historical trends. These sources of revenue pay the cost of the plans. The weekly and indemnity budget is expected to have a surplus of $57,100 if claim numbers and costs remain consistent for the remainder of the year. Workers' compensation is provided to have a deficit of $314,900. This is the result of the number of claims and the duration of these claims, as well as projections for the remainder of the year. The HR department proposes to add one FTE to the staff and complement in the 2022 budget to assist in managing these claims. If considering weekly indemnity and workers' compensation together, the projection is a shortfall of $257,800. This shortfall could be funded from their respective reserves that have a projected year-end balance of $50,000 and $3.1 million. Assessment, the cost from MPAC will be on budget. Provincial offenses estimates a $10,000 surplus after cost sharing with Bruce County. 
This is the result of revenue trending higher than budget. And we've seen ticket volume is 241 tickets higher than the same point in 2021. This department has also seen savings from not being open to the public, offset by higher mailing and form costs. The health unit, Markdale Hospital, and commitment to Georgian College budgets are all on track. Property. A surplus of $30,000 is anticipated as a result of staffing changes, savings and maintenance costs with the administration building being closed to the public. The capital budget is estimated to have a $5,000 shortfall as a result of unbudgeted heating and cooling repairs. Taxation and grants. A projection for supplementary taxation and write-offs will not be available on tax adjustment until tax adjustment estimates are provided by local municipal staff later in the year. Planning, agriculture, forestry, and trails anticipate balanced operating and capital budgets. Economic development and tourism. ECDEV projects an operating budget surplus of 35,700 and a balanced capital budget. Tourism projects their budgets for operating and capital will be sufficient for the year. Gray routes, an operating budget surplus of 76,500 is projected with savings from staffing changes to reduce cleaning costs and the postponement of the traveling exhibit. After considering the sources of funding for the shortfall in the general store budget that I've mentioned that is in the motion, the remainder of the capital budget is on target. Social services, which captures Ontario Works and children's services. Uh, overall, the budget for Ontario Works and employment support projects a surplus of $186,400. This department has made note that caseload is 370 cases less than anticipated, and that's attributed to uh, people being on Canada recovery benefit, and it is expected that this caseload will increase when CRB ends this fall. Children's Services has supported frontline workers in providing care to school-aged children for four months in the first half of the year that has estimated costs of $425,000. Fee subsidy savings will be directed to support operators and home child care providers with additional costs as a result of COVID. As a result, the Children's Services budget projects a $12,800 surplus. The total sur projected surplus for the social services department totals $199,200. Housing is projecting a $30,000 surplus from the nonprofit subsidy portion of this budget. A shortfall in tenant related revenue estimated to be 50,000 is being offset by savings in salaries and benefits of 40,000, as well as savings in other individual operating budget line items. The capital budget is on target with projects being rebudgeted into 2022 as a result of COVID and tender results. Long-term care. The projected year-end results for the long-term care department were discussed in the financial report to the Long-Term Care Committee of Management on July 27th, and those minutes have been uh, already approved by council. The long-term care administration budget is sufficient to year-end. The operating budgets for the three care homes have a combined projected shortfall of $630,600. Reductions in ministry funding and staffing costs are the driving factors behind this projection. Each of the capital budgets is expected to end the year on target with some projects carried over 2022 as a result of COVID. Paramedic services. This budget may have $145,000 shortfall from non-wage costs if the full budget for wages and benefits is required. Increased costs for fuel, a few significant vehicle and stretcher repairs, professional fees and uniform costs are the primary factors for the projected shortfall. The funding allocation for the core budget, which is the land ambulance side, matches the budget. We've been notified that we will receive approximately $7.8 million in 2021. Wages and benefit costs were on budget to June 30th. Staff is monitoring lost time as well as vacation usage and is reviewing hours to ensure maximum claim entitlements are re received for COVID and vaccine distribution programs. The budget was prepared before the Community Paramedicine for Long-Term Care project was approved. This provides an additional $1 million in revenue and expenditures for the year. This is a separate budget and reporting from the Community Paramedicine Program that has been in place for a number of years that has a $371,000 budget in 2021. 
With the exception of the debenture for the Chatsworth Station and transfers to reserve, the capital budget for paramedic services is funding from reserve and proceeds from the sale of used equipment. The capital budget is on target. Ambulances were ordered early in the year and delivery has been delayed as a result of COVID. The revised ETA date is now early 2022. For transportation services, uh, they project a $14,200 operating budget deficit resulting from fuel costs, individual vehicle and uh, cleaning protocols as a result of COVID and the review of domes. These costs have been offset by savings from staffing changes. The capital budget is estimated to have a $690,000 surplus from projects that were tendered early in the year and is offset by the unbudgeted repairs to domes. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Mary Lou. There's a question from Councillor Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, thank you, Mary Lou, for your report. Uh, a lot of uh, good information there. In regards to the EMS uh, operating budget, will that uh, transfer from the province that they have uh, uh, agreed uh, is coming, will that get us to the 50-50 uh, funding agreement level? Through you, Mr. Warden. No, it will not. Um, Are we going to get close? I'll, I'll burn back. I'll give you a calculation later. Um, the, the short answer to this is the current year's funding is based on last year's approved budget adjusted for PSAB. So they will fund things like future employment benefit costs, future WSIB anticipated costs, um, vacation accruals. Um, they fund our equipment or our capital to the extent of our annual amortization, which is of course a historical. So when we buy an ambulance and we anticipate it's gonna last six years, we've paid for it up front and they're giving us a sixth a year. So we'll get the final amount in the year that we're re replacing the ambulance. Um, there used to be an inflationary component that ceased in about 2019. So when we prepared the 2021 budget, they give a template on how to calculate the costs and what their revenue share will be. So as a result of filling up what they call their planning form for 2021 last year, we, knew, we had a pretty good idea of where we would be with our revenue from them. And it was within, I think, $89 which was rounding when we did the budget. So they're always behind. Right. So I, if I might, Mr. Warden, so I guess, I guess my question then is, are, are they getting better at meeting that 50-50 agreement or are they getting worse over time? Where's the trend going? It, it did improve, <laughs> but I will, I will use the caveat that they, they base it based on the budget. So if we come in under budget and um, say, for example, they were funding 48% and we were funding 52. If we came in under budget and it, their share would have been 47% and ours 53, then there's an adjustment. If we end up with actuals where our share went to 55% and their share went to 45, they don't provide any additional funding. So it's a, I guess it's a win-win for them. Here's the maximum that we're going to provide you and um, you adjust your budget accordingly. And if you have a deficit as a result of uh, an increase in modified duty, claims, fuel, vehicle costs, whatever, um, that's on the county taxpayer. Right, so I guess you're right. It's a win-win for them. Be damned to cost to the taxpayer. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, maybe it's time to call the question on the motion, which uh, is to receive this report. And with respect to the uh, Grey Roots uh, General Store, uh, is there anyone opposed? <clears throat> Seeing none, that is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, so next, we are dealing with item 7B, uh, which is the maintenance of the MITEL voiceover internet protocol uh, system. 
It's moved by Councillor Carlton and seconded by Councillor Mackey. Jody, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, as you probably know uh, from me having spoken a couple of times this year about capital budgets, um, we've been looking at making some investment in our phone system for a few years now. Um, we started setting aside some capital over the past several years, and we currently uh, intend to make some investment in the phone system within the next uh, couple. We've also engaged a consultant this year, it's Nielsen IT, and they're reviewing our telephony accounts and our technology gaps in our current system. Um, that's both the tools that we have available to us now that we may not be making full use of and any functionality that might be available in the market in different systems. And they're gonna be uh, providing their report um, this, this autumn that will include technology investment recommendations over the next several years. So what we're looking for here is essentially a one-year renewal of our support contract with uh, Mitel, which is the system used for voice over internet phone systems. And that would ensure we have the necessary system support until we have a firm plan for our telephony investment. So by renewing what we get um, is essentially access to software and security updates and a service level agreement on parts and replacement um, or, or support with Mitel. Over the past three years, we've used support through, uh, through the vendor, the reseller, which is on target and Mitel on nearly a monthly basis. And sometimes that has been in critical components of the system, such as a switch at long-term care or even our, our uh, hardware at our primary data center. If we weren't to renew, we would uh, still be able to purchase hardware updates and technical support, um, but we would lose essentially the warranty on the equipment. So unless it's very new, um, some of it would not be replaced unless we paid for it. And we certainly wouldn't have that service level agreement, but more importantly, we wouldn't have access to the software and security updates. So we'd be assuming a fair amount of risk um, at both prolonged uh, service outages if we did have any interruption to service, but also that cybersecurity aspect if we're not keeping the system patched and up to date. These type of maintenance agreements on software and hardware components are, are fairly standard in the industry. Um, in terms of the finances, uh, this, the cost of, the, of a single year renewal is uh, $24,320. That's including our portion of the, uh, the HST. As it currently stands, we would be able to cover um, some of this with surplus, um, anticipated surplus in the IS operating budget, and any shortfall we would hope to pick up um, from the IT infrastructure reserve. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Are there any questions? Council, I do not see any questions. Uh, if that's the case, then I'm going to call the question. Uh, anyone opposed to the motion before you? No hands, so that is carried. Thank you very much, Jody. Thank you. Next, we're gonna deal with item uh, 7C that puts Heather on deck. Uh, we're dealing with the um, September 30th, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. It is moved by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Mellon. Heather, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Um, Many of you will have received this at your local municipalities. The federal government has established or, uh, September 30th as the National Day for Truth, Truth and Reconciliation. In the past, it's been known as Orange Shirt Day. This is a day to reflect on the past and share stories and history of Indigenous peoples, their families, their communities. We can do this through open discussions, exhibits, storytelling, and as well, if approved by council, the Every Child Matters flag will be flown at all uh, Gray County locations and the flag is lowered to half mast in recognition of this national day. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission report was published in June, 2015 and contained 94 calls to action uh, within it to remedy the legacy of residential schools in Canada and to advance the process of reconciliation across Canada. Recent discoveries of remains and unmarked graves in residential schools have once again brought this issue to the forefront. Gray County has begun its own journey of reconciliation and support of our Indigenous peoples. A land acknowledgement was recently passed by Council and is included in our Council meetings, significant Gray County events, and part of introduction to corporate documents such as the recently adopted Forest Management Plan. 
As well, in April of this year, Council supported the signing of the Declaration of Mutual Commitment and Friendship with the Wicodong Indigenous Friendship Centre as part of the provincial commitment of strengthening relationships between Ontario's Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, a move that was supported across the province by AMO. And I want to thank Jill Patterson, our manager at Grey Roots, uh, for helping me out with some of the um, exciting ideas that are happening in Grey Roots. They are producing a physical display of the land acknowledgement at the entrance to the museum as a recognition for the long established indigenous presence in this area. They're also working with community stakeholders to form an indigenous, indigenous advisory circle aimed at guiding the development of indigenous focus projects in the future. Gray County's recognition of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation supported by AMO is one further step in Gray County's journey to acknowledge, remember, support, and honor our Indigenous people across Gray County, Ontario, and Canada. I'm happy to take any questions for that, Mr. Warden. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councillor Milne, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Heather, for your work uh, and other staff on this uh, very important uh, um, motion. Uh, I think it's most appropriate and uh, any opportunity we have to educate ourselves and reflect on the history of our area and of our, all of our people is very valuable and I will be supporting this. Absolutely. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Councillor Robinson, then I'll come to you, Councillor Burling. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you. Um, Clerk Morrison, those uh, words certainly resonated and very much appreciate uh, the time you have taken to prepare that very um, important uh, presentation that you provided. I wholeheartedly uh, support the, um, the motion that is before council. There's many opportunities for learning and um, education and sharing stories. And I would encourage my colleagues around the virtual table to support the motion at hand. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Burling. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I just want to tell Kenneth Council that this motion, similar, very similar to that, was 100% uh, supported at, at George Love's Council last night. So just so you know. Very good. I do not see any other hands, so I will then I'll call the question on the motion to um, to recognize September 30th as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Is there anyone opposed? I'm seeing no hands, that is carried. Thank you very much. We're on to item 7D now. <clears throat> uh, that puts uh, Randy on deck and we're dealing with the survey partnership with the University of Guelph. This item has been moved by Councillor Keaveney and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Randy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden and good afternoon, everyone. The purpose of this report is to um, make you aware of a joint partnership between Gray County and the University of Guelph to implement a COVID survey countywide to Gray County residents. Uh, as, as we know, rural residents throughout Ontario have been impacted by the ongoing pandemic and have been impacted in ways that have not been fully realized. Uh, Dr. Leith Deacon from the University of Guelph has embarked on a research project to gather experiences from rural residents in Ontario. And this survey is a, a key piece to that research. The, the survey aims to find out how the pandemic has changed the daily lives of rural residents and how residents think it will change their lives moving forward. Uh, the survey examines things like well-being, social behavior, day-to-day -day living, and, and risk management. The results from the survey will be helpful for a variety of projects and may assist with future decision making by both uh, the county and local municipalities regarding ongoing pandemic recovery efforts. Uh, Steve Furness and Brad Noble have been working on this project, but they had some other meetings they had to attend to today. Um, so they, they send their regrets. Kimberly Trombley has also been assisting with this project and I just wanna thank them for their, their work on this, uh, this exciting uh, partnership. This is a joint initiative between uh, the social services department, economic development, and, and the planning department. <clears throat> the survey has already been completed in Huron and Perth counties and will be completed in another six counties, in, including Gray County. Uh, it's currently being refined, uh, the survey, by county staff and Professor Deacon, 
with implementation by mail plans later this month. Um, there are set questions that the University of Guelph wants to maintain to ensure consistency uh, across the surveys being done. Uh, however, there are opportunities to add additional questions and, and Gray County staff are, are working with uh, Dr. Deacon to include questions related to things like children's services, housing, and economic development related questions. The funding for the project is, is primarily being funded by OMAFRA through the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance uh, in the amount of $15,000 for our area. And the county is providing an additional 5,000 to assist with the cost of the mail out so that we can send this to as many Gray County residents as possible. That 5,000 will be shared equally between the existing budgets of the economic development planning and social services departments. The research results will be collected and analyzed by the University of Guelph and Gray County will have access to the results. Uh, and, and as mentioned, the results will help to fill an important gap in our understanding of how the pandemic has impacted uh, Gray County residents. Uh, once the project has been completed, Dr. Lee plans to attend uh, Gray County Council to present the findings. And, and of course, to discuss the results of the study once, uh, once uh, all the work has been finalized. Uh, so at this stage, it's, uh, the recommendation is just to receive this report for information, but we wanted to make council aware in case you start see, uh, hearing questions from residents about, about the survey once it uh, goes out in the mail, hopefully later this month. So happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randy. I agree that these uh, partnerships have been very, very uh, helpful to us and productive. Uh, Councillor Keaveny. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Randy. I'm really looking forward to uh, the results of this survey, and it may be too soon to ask this question, but I'm wondering if there's any uh, potential or likelihood that the results can be broken down um, for each lower tier, because this information will be really valuable to all of us as we go forward with our recovery efforts. That's a, that's a great question. That was one of our first questions too to Dr. Deacon. And, and there is actually a, a, a breakdown of, of where, um, where the residents, when they're responding, what municipality, local municipality they reside in. Uh, so there will be the opportunity to break that down further by local municipality. So we'll be able to review this, not only from, a, a, you know, from the various counties that are participating in this project from a regional perspective, but also looking at it from a great county lens and right down to a local municipal lens. So we'll be happy to uh, share the results of, of that. Um, and that's some of the results that we will be able to uh, analyze further through our uh, through Brad Noble, our planning data analysis coordinator, once we receive that information. And we'll, of course, share that uh, with local municipalities because we think it'll be important information to have going forward for sure. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's time to call the question. Is there anyone opposed to the motion before you? Seeing no hands, that is carried. Uh, we're on to item 7E. Uh, that puts Jennifer on deck. We're dealing with the, um, the corporate COVID-19 uh, COVID immunization uh, policy. That item is moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Keaveny. Jennifer, you have the floor. Hi, good morning or good afternoon, I suppose it is by now. Uh, provided for your information is our updated immunization policy. I'm hopeful that members of council have had an opportunity to read through that policy. I'm just gonna give it a quick once over. Uh, we are referring to this policy as a soft mandatory policy. Uh, we've requested vaccination certificates for all vaccinated staff members of Gray County. Um, excluding long-term care. Long-term care employees have uh, been through this process for many months due to uh, different Ministry of Health directives for our long-term care workers. So this policy essentially matches what our long-term care workers have been providing and have been using as policy for the past few months. The mandatory immunization policy requests that staff members provide either their vaccination or a medical exemption, or if neither is provided, staff members will then receive an education training session and will then be required to complete a rapid antigen test, test at regular intervals. The regular intervals that have been recommended by Dr. Era and the public health unit are twice weekly right now. That could um, 
increase in frequency if we are in an outbreak situation again. Um, and this policy is in effect and we've requested that all staff members send us their proof of vaccination if they have that uh, by September 7th, which was two or three days ago. Um, the policy is a policy that you can see throughout the province. There are two different types of policies right now. You have the soft mandatory and the mandatory mandatory. Um, we are not in an outbreak situation in all of our facilities right now. Uh, so we felt that this softer approach was a better approach for our staff members. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions on the policy itself. Councillor Mellon has a question. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the report. The policy is uh, is uh, very well thought out, I think. But my question is, does this policy apply to county council members? And if it does not, why not? Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, uh, to Councillor Milne, no, this policy does not apply currently to uh, county council members. As elected officials, you're not considered an employee. And if um, council members would like to create or so just the creation of their own policy, I'm, help, I'm happy to assist with that. But the reason um, we did not include council members in this policy is because you do not fit into the employment category of an employee. You are an elected official. Well, and, and thank you for that. If I might, Mr. Warden, thank you for that response, Jennifer. And, and it was absolutely what I anticipated, but um, on the face of it, um, in my mind, at least, it just, it's all wrong for council to sit here and improve a policy and say, but it doesn't apply to us. That is wrong in my mind. And I think we should voluntarily agree to comply with this policy. Just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councillor Mackey, you are next. Thanks, Mr. Warren and Jennifer. Thanks for all the uh, the work you've done on this policy. Just in light of Dr. Uh, Era's comments this morning in regards to the medical exemptions, I'm just wondering if, you know, in an attempt to try and educate our staff, it would, if it would be uh, wise to add verbiage about uh, how rare it is to actually achieve a medical exemption. I'm just wondering if that section of our policy, whether there might be an opportunity just to communicate that with our staff. And I'm certainly willing to provide my uh, double proof of uh, vaccination to the county uh, when they make the request. Thanks. Through you, Mr. Warden, to Councillor Mackey. Uh, I personally don't believe we should be making an opinion on the medical exemptions. I think that gets into a position of giving medical advice and this policy is not meant to. Um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons has provided uh, physicians with advice and guidance on what is a medical exemption. And I believe Dr. Aaron, the public health unit have as well discussed with medical professionals. I think um, folks are going to need to speak with their physicians and I would be very wary to put in any sort of medical advice in this policy. Thanks for that response, Jennifer. I guess I wasn't looking at putting in medical advice, uh, just putting in that they're very rare. Um, that's not advice in my opinion, thanks. Okay, next is uh, Councillor Potter. Thank you, and just agreeing with Councillor Milne that, <clears throat> that uh, council should, uh, should play by the same rules as employees in this case. I also would like to see it apply to anybody who wants to attend a council meeting uh, as a delegation or anyone else. If they're going to be in the same room or in the county building with our employees, then I think they should be required to show proof of vaccination. So I would, I would extend Councillor Milne's suggestion uh, to, that, to that far once we start having in-person meetings again. Thank you, sir. Um, Madam uh, CAO, oh no, Madam Clerk, <laughs> just uh, picking up on a bit of a trend here. Uh, what would be the process that uh, council would uh, follow if we wanted to extend? I know we're having a discussion about the corporate policy uh, for staff, but if uh, in keeping with the trend that seems to be coming forward here, people want to extend it to council and visitors, would we need to create a separate policy or would, could we? 
uh, make an amendment to this existing policy? Um, I think, it, and certainly um, Kim or Jennifer can uh, jump in at any time. If if council is would like to voluntary voluntarily follow the staff policy that is before you today, I don't think there's any concerns from our um, perspective of you providing that information to um, HR for for uh, your records here. And with respect to uh, Councillor Potter's uh, suggestion about extending it to. Uh, visitors of uh, the county building, or county facilities. Uh, that's a different matter um, altogether, and and I'm going to. I see uh, our CAO has her hand up. I'm uh, going to leave that with her too. Yeah, I'm going to acknowledge you, Kim, but I, I apologize to Councillor Soever and decide. But Kim, I'll acknowledge you now. You're on mute, Kim. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I would, I th one of the things that in the policy is that if, if you are not vaccinated or you didn't, do not wish to disclose your vaccination status, then you're being subject to rapid testing. Um, I would be concerned that we might be attracting a, a difficult situation if we said that you couldn't attend a council meeting and, and couldn't be in the room without being vaccinated. I think what we could do is though um, suggest that, that people who want to be in chambers, which is a small enclosed space, potentially for an extended period of time, um, we might ask that, that people undergo a rapid test um, before before being in chambers. I wonder if, if, if that, if they didn't have proof of vaccination, could you be tested? I'd just like to give people a choice the same way that we're giving our, our staff and the, the people that are coming into our buildings as contractors, et cetera, a, a choice. Our ultimate goal is to make sure that everybody is as safe as we can possibly make them. And I wonder if, if that would be a, a way forward. Councilor Potter. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, I, I know that we're all about giving people choices, but I would like the choice not to have to sit in a room with people that may or may not have uh, a, vi a dangerous virus. And uh, I, so I think that uh, requiring at least that they wear a mask uh, and be socially distanced would not be too much to ask. Okay. Okay, I'm going to come back to what we do with all of this, but uh, let's turn next to Councillor Soever. Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, the yeah, and I, I agree with um, Deputy Mayor Potter and and the other councillors that um, I think we should have a, a policy, a separate policy, obviously, but it could mirror, it be exactly the same as the one for staff, and, and I certainly agree with the CAO that. Um, you know, there should be choice, but the choice should be, you know, you get tested, you wear a mask and, you know, maybe we, we make sure that those that aren't vaccinated uh, sit, you know, in a unvaccinated person's area. So, um, you know, if people that are cho have chosen to be vaccinated, um, they, they can sit in on one side of the aisle much like a wedding, you have one family on one side and the other family on the other side, you know, or something to that effect. Because I know that um, people are concerned and, um, you know, certainly being vaccinated does reduce um, your risk of transmission. It's not zero. You can still get ill and transmit, but the odds are much less. And, you know, I, there's a lot of talk about rights, but I would point out that automobile accidents kill about 10 uh, only one less than one tenth of the people annually than COVID did over the the first year of COVID, and uh, there are all kinds of restrictions on motor vehicles. You need a license. You can't speed. You can't drink, and you have to wear a seatbelt. So you know, I not you know for something that's ten times more deadly um, to have to wear a mask and get tested. I, I don't see the argument really that that is, um, you know, impinging on anyone's rights more than we already have in all areas of life. So Madam uh, Clerk, 
is it appropriate that uh, we simply deal with this by saying that staff takes note of the council's uh, comments and will bring back some sort of a, uh, recommendations around uh, council and the public or do we need a motion? Uh, I, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I think an amendment to this would be appropriate that staff bring back a report on um, two policies or guidelines, one related to council and one related to um, the general public. I, I think staff needs a bit of time to do some research, research on what um, else is, who, who else is doing what out there and um, so that there's some consistency. So um, I think because it is uh, germane to the, the policy itself and we're just looking for more information from a council perspective and a public perspective, I think an amendment would be most appropriate. Very good. Thank you. Councillor Desai, you're next. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, the one question that I do have is, would it be um, beyond the policy, I guess, or would it be impossible to add uh, a portion to the policy that, that requires um, council members to adhere to this particular policy as well? That was my first question. Uh, my second question was with regards to... Um, proof of vaccination before entering uh, the county building. Uh, we've seen um, that uh, increasingly a lot of democracy, a lot of um, public services are uh, able to be offered uh, online uh, through Zoom. And I, I don't see any reason why that cannot continue beyond um, uh, COVID. If I, on September 23rd, if I wanted to go to a restaurant and I didn't have proof of vaccination, I wouldn't be allowed to enter into a restaurant. So we need to ensure that that same safety is extended to staff uh, in, in the county setting as well. So I, I do uh, perhaps take a more hardline stance on this, uh, perhaps than some of my colleagues, but I do feel that it is important. Uh, I saw a meme uh, late yesterday that uh, we don't remember uh, that, well, I, I don't remember anyways, the times when you'd be asked of whether uh, whether you wanted to sit in the smoking or non-smoking section, because as a society, we decided that smokers should be allowed to smoke freely, just not in an area that endangers uh, other people with secondhand smoke. And I think it's a, it's a bit of a parallel to this. So um, in Grey Highlands, uh, we've moved to a hybrid uh, meeting where uh, I know at the first meeting in September, uh, three members of council uh, were sitting in council chambers and four members attended uh, remotely. So uh, that is still something that can that can happen going forward. I know um, the, the number of times I've uh, bothered the, uh, the CAO with, you know, when are we getting back in chambers? And that, that has been a consideration uh, for members who do want to attend virtually to be able to continue attending virtually. So I don't think we're really stopping anyone from uh, partaking in, in council democracy or partaking in public services. Um, so I do think that uh, a proof of vaccination to come into county buildings uh, uh, should perhaps be a, a requirement. Um, but I, I, I do believe that a, uh, an amendment will come forward or, or a follow-up report will come. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that in staff's hands uh, in, in, in the form of these comments. Thank you. Madam CEO. Thank you, Mr. Warden. There are a number of um, uh, legal considerations around all of this, and, and I think it, if Council would give us a little bit of time just to ensure that we've done all of our due diligence here, um, we can come back with the, the best advice that's available at this time. I think you all can appreciate that this is a, a very much an, an evolving area of discussion, um, and we want to make sure that we're doing um, the, the right things. So we will work on this and we'll bring back some information for you to consider. So Madam CAO, um, the clerk has recommended a, an amendment to the um, motion that we have before us. Would you suggest that we not amend, but simply leave it in your hands and something will come back? That's absolutely fine. Okay. Uh, Councillor Mackey, you're next. Thanks, Warden. And uh, through you to either uh, Kim or Jennifer, just wondering if you have any sense on the uh, percentages of the population of staff that are currently vaccinated. And uh, second question is the, uh, the rapid antigen testing kits that are going to be required. Uh, is that funded through the province or the health unit or will that be a cost to uh, Gray County? Thank you. 
Uh, Go ahead. Through you, Mr. Warden, uh, as far as percentage rates for staff, uh, you're sitting at around um, just over 70% um, currently. Uh, we are still expecting more um, vaccination certificates to come in. Um, and we do know there are a certain amount of staff that are within the course of vaccination. So maybe have received their first dose, but not their second or 14 days haven't passed. So we expect that to go up in time. And um, our long-term care partners, our long-term care staff are resting above 90%. Um, and as far as the rapid antigen testing, uh, we believe those will be provided through the pro province as of That's right now. They have been provided for our paramedic group and our long-term care group. Uh, Dr. Era has assured us they will be made available to us as well. And we are anticipating these will be take-home kits. Uh, we will be providing um, training for staff on how to use that. Our paramedics uh, staff are going to help us uh, conduct that training. And then staff will be sent home with these kits. Very good, Councilor Mackey. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, just a follow up in regards to uh, Jennifer's response around the take home kits. What sort of verification will there be then that uh, the uh, the test was uh, accurately uh, uh, provided to us? Through you, Mr. Warden, to Councillor Mackey, right now we're considering, uh, much like the self-screening uh, that we do daily to attend work, our COVID self-screening, it will be a similar self-screening uh, option where folks uh, can go online and verify that they have completed the test and that they have received a negative result, or conversely, that they received a positive result and are now attending for a proper PCR test. Um, there is in um, the works uh, some... Uh, software uh, that can, uh, you, you can upload a picture of your test. Um, we're not sure how uh, common those will be. It's an evolving um, IT resource that we may be able to avail ourselves to. Uh, but for right now, um, our intent is to do a screening option for those staff members. And um, we trust our staff members. We have trusted everyone with um, self-screening daily, and uh, we will take that same uh, attitude towards the um, the rapid antigen testing. Okay, uh, Councillor Potter, you're next. Thank you, and I, I wonder if we should go ahead with an amendment that would require members of council to uh, abide by this policy uh, and then give the CAO and her staff a chance to look into the legal implications because I know there are, there are issues around whether we can actually deny the public access to a public building. So, so I, I think we have time to look into that. And I, I think she's right that we do need to uh, consider the ramifications of that. So, but I have no issue at all going back to Councillor Mills' original uh, suggestion that we, uh, that we amend this to include all of council and ask staff to look into the implications regarding public attending council meetings. Okay, so I'm turning to you, Madam uh, Clerk. Uh, is that like a, an amendment by way of motion and do I require a seconder? And we... um, through you, Mr. Warden, I would recommend that it is a formal motion, um, an amendment to the main motion that uh, staff be directed to bring back a report on uh, COVID-19 immunization policy relative to uh, Gray County Council members and uh, a second one on uh, the public. Right. And that way, that will give staff time to um, gather as much information and legal considerations as possible. In the meantime, um, if council members want to voluntarily um, provide their information to um, human resources, I think Jen's nodding, so I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, I'm hearing that uh, Councillor Potter, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, I think he is suggesting that we amend today's motion to include uh, council, sort of it's mandatory on council as it is for uh, staff, and as well amending it to allow for staff to bring back uh, a report and recommendations with respect to the public. Have I misstated your intention, Councillor Potter? No, that's exactly it, Warden. Okay. Uh, so if that is the case, then I would need a seconder um, and that's seconded by Councillor Desai. And so we will now have discussion on the amend amendment. Is there any discussion on that? 
I do not see any hands. Uh, so I will call the question on the amendment, which is to um, make it mandatory on council and to ask staff to bring back a report with respect to the public. Um, anyone opposed to that? Seeing none, that is carried. Now we're back onto the main uh, motion as amended. Councilor Desai, you had your hand up. Uh, sorry, uh, Warden Hicks, I had my hand up to second uh, the, ah, okay. the, the amendment. My apologies. Okay, are we uh, all popped out on this? Are people looking for a surge in energy? Sorry, I'm still going back on the electric vehicle thing. Um, okay, then I will call the question. Sorry about that. Uh, is there anyone opposed to the main motion as amended? And there is no one opposed, so I'm going to say that that too is carried. Thank you very much. Um, right, we're going to go back now to item 6B, which is the Clarksburg uh, Dome issue. That is going to be moved by uh, Councillor, who is that? So ever. Uh, we need a seconder uh, to put that on the floor. Uh, Councillor uh, Potter. And Councillor Swever, you have the floor. Yes, um, I pulled this from the consent agenda because I was kind of disappointed it was on the consent agenda because there, there's a number of issues in this um, report that, that warrant um, you know, some close examination by council. It is a $110,000 hit. Um, and as council will recall that as recently as July, we were, we were talking about $40,000 in repair. And in looking at this report, and it's quite a detailed report by Mr. Knight here, um, he, he notes that both with it, in the collapsed debris and the still standing panels was the fact that much plywood had been replaced as part of the 2020 re-roofing. And that re-roofing was done in late 2020. Moreover, much of the new plywood appeared to be inadequately installed in that the plywood is not glued to the lumber framing. Plywood nailing is much inferior to the standard of nailed domes. Um, some plywood is installed as other than full sheets and some plywood is installed with the face grain horizontal rather than vertical. And some plywood is too small to fit in the opening within the panels and therefore does not and cannot contact the panels lumber framing. And it says all of these conditions were identified in the writer's March 1st, 2021 report. Individually and collectively, they all compromise the structural capacity of the panels containing such defects, as well as that of the dome itself. And then there were repairs undertaken in April 2021. And, um, you know, and then there was an inspection which caused this uh, latest report. And in, also in the report, um, it says, um, that overall it's in fair condition and in, with a general appearance of being tired, the large quantity of new fresh plywood is visually misleading that it is generally not adequate to serve its intended structural um, function. So, um, and then he concludes later on that he's not privy. He says um, that much of the, Fall, issues of decay and damage or deterioration requiring repair were noted. Most, if not all of these, would have existed prior to the 2020 re-roofing. We are not privy to the details of the 2020 contract and do not imply responsibility to any party for these matters not having been addressed. So, you know, what that report says is that, um, you know, the the dome was re-roofed uh, just one year ago or, or late last year. And the, you know, some of the issues were there uh, before, but some appear to have been caused in, by the manner in which the um, re-roofing was done and that the plywood patches were not uh, properly installed. So my questions were, um, what are we, what were the terms of the, what is the obligation of the roofing contractor under their contract um, and, and what are we doing to recover potential damages from the roofing contractor? It's clear that, 
the this engineer um you know like where was the contractor that did the re-roofing uh, you know was the contract broad enough that they should fix any issues that weren't fixed and uh you know what were the terms in terms of uh, making sure that the plywood was put in properly um and and how do we check as the counties who who on county staff signs off on the repairs when they're properly done because clearly in this case we've got a hundred thousand dollars of expenditure and 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 some of that may just be a consequence of how the roofing was done okay i see that uh jim nickel is with us i don't um, know if not i is i'm sorry it's jim are you yeah i'm here okay yeah. thanks you and i were trying to connect before, yeah. before mm -hmm. this um i will start off answering and then maybe jim can um jump in with some more of the details but first of all the reason why this is on consent is because there was not a specific um, question or decision for council to make. I approved these repairs on, emer on an emergency basis because we were advised by the engineer that there was the potential for the dome to collapse. And that was not something that I was willing to risk. We, the dome needs to be fixed. We needed to have, um, we need to have this infrastructure in place. And, and we're not in a position at this point in time to be building a new one in, in, in preparation for um, the, the next winter season, nor were we able to identify um, an alternative location to store the materials. So that's why it went forward as it did. That's why um, it's on, on consent. Um, we wanted you to be aware of, of what had happened. Councillor Soever, you are absolutely correct that um, there are certainly issues um, with the work that was done. And Jim can speak to the conversations that he's had with the former contractor. It's unfortunate that um, the, J Jim is not the manager who, who drafted the original um, tender document. So he will only be speaking to um, what went out. Um, I think when Pat brought the earlier report back in July, he did comment to council, these domes are, are quite aged, right? This is a 35 year old structure. Um, no one builds domes anymore. And within the industry itself, there are a very, very limited handful of people we come to understand who really have the uh, in-depth expertise um, about how dome repairs should be conducted and, and, and how they should be maintained. So I think certainly this has been a learning process for all of us as staff, but Jim, I'll let you speak to um, your discussions uh, with the original contractor. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, we had a, a partial collapse of the dome in February. So we had uh, Jim Knight come and take a look at it. And repairs were done by Van Pelt. We replaced six panels and replaced a truss, repaired the truss. Um, those repairs weren't, weren't related to the sapphire work, but uh, James Lake noted that the panels weren't glued. The panels that uh, sapphire or the plywood that sapphire had replaced weren't glued. So um, when we paid, we get an engineer's report from sapphire on. Um, January 18th, excuse me. And payment was made for their whole back around February 19th. That's when we received the, but it wasn't until we had the repairs done that we you knew that Sapphire's work was, was deficient. Um, we, uh, James, I suggested we do another in-depth inspection that we, that you have received. Uh, to determine the extent of the sapphires repair or their deficiencies and the, the condition of the dome. That inspection was done July 19th. We had a meeting with Sapphire on July 27th at the yard to discuss uh, his cost sharing for the deficiencies. Uh, so far, he hasn't got back to us on what he's willing to, to contribute. But we're, um, I don't know if, not that he's avoiding us, but I, he said he couldn't. Our first suggestion, I think, was you pay for half the 
reshingling and for all the plywood. It would have been around sixty thousand dollars that we su we suggested. So he hasn't got back to us on that. So that's where we stand right now. There's a one year warranty on it. As I mentioned, the substantial completion was February second. So we have until probably February second to uh, for the warranty to expire. Yes, uh, thank you for that. That's, that's good to know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I recognize that, you know, structural integrity of domes is a, it's a complicated thing. And certainly it's like an egg. If you have a crack, then it's no, you know, uh, a circular or an oval structure is very strong until there's one weakness. And then it's kind of like when you have a crack in an egg, it doesn't last very long. So um, yeah. certainly um, the, in the selection of Sapphire, um, did, we, um, did we look at their experience with these kind of jobs or? Supposedly the previous maintenance um, manager had, was familiar with them and he said they did good work, but I don't think that they were probably good at shingling domes, but not re replacing plywood or the structural component of it. And the engineer that they use wasn't, I, I don't think, familiar like James Knight or um, storage systems with the construction of domes. So that, and, and you you were correct with your um, comment about why didn't we do a, we should have done a inspection prior to the shingling and that would have given everybody a, a, a proper footing to bid on it, which we did before the Dundalk and um, Chatsworth Jones, we, we did some work on them this year and we had the report before they did the work. But that's, yeah, that was an oversight. Well, that's great to know, you know, I mean, mistakes will happen and, uh, mm -hmm. it's, and we learn from them. Right, and it's expensive lesson, but. Uh, Most are, uh, that's why yeah. we remember them. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. Great, thank you everyone. I don't see any other hands. So with that said, I'm gonna call the question. Anyone opposed to the motion? No hand showing, that is carried. So I am back now, lost my little list here. I think we're on to adjournment, aren't we? Uh, other business, Mr. Warden, notice of motion and then adjournment. <laughs> is there any other business? Um, Councilor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden and through you, members of County Council, it is with great pleasure that I announce my intention to run for warden for the year 2022. If elected, it would be my honor to represent, serve and work tirelessly on behalf of and with members of Gray County Council, staff and the citizens of Gray County. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other, any other, other business? Um, Madam CAO? Thank you. Just in, in follow up uh, to our uh, earlier discussion, I did want to reconfirm with with County Council that um, the the building, this administration building, is reopening to the public um, beginning uh, on Monday, on September the thirteenth. Um, so um, on a by appointment basis only, as much as we can do that, but certainly we'll be providing counter service uh, to the public. And that was part of the, the rationale and by ensuring that we had a good uh, solid vaccination policy, et cetera. As well, some of you would be aware that uh, this building is a pooling station. And so the, the advanced pools are happening here at the building um, on, on Friday through Monday this week, and then again on election day. Um, so given that the public will be in and out of the building at, at, at a much higher level, um, on those days we'll probably have a, only a minimal amount of, of regular staff, but we are working with Elections Canada to ensure that this is conducted as safely as possible. Thank you, Councillor Visa. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, the, the last uh, meeting under other business, I did ask this question around um, uh, when we're coming back in person. And uh, the CAO had mentioned October, but that we were going to endeavor uh, to come back for the second meeting in September. I, my question was regarding uh, the, the integrity of that timeline. If it is, uh, if, if we are any closer to being back in September or if, if uh, it is still October. 
through you, Mr. Warden. Um, my most recent discussion with, with our communications manager, Rob, um, is that we will be uh, looking at the first meeting in October. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Warden Hanks. You're welcome. I don't see any other hands, so I think we're on to any notices of motion. Seeing none, we're finally ready for adjournment. Uh, so it is moved by Councillor Brody and seconded by Councillor Milne that we now adjourn. And I just want to thank everybody for a meeting that was anything but static. Get it? Anyways, <laughs> have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.